And today's guest, we've got uh, Johnny Steele. Uh, thanks for coming on today, John. I'm just going to tell people a wee bit about your story. You've spent over 20 years in prison, made successful prison escapes. Um, you've obviously had a, mad, a bit of a mad life up and down through, but on the streets of Glasgow. Um, so people think it's people are interested to hear your story and what you've been through, because I know you've got a book out called The Bird That Never Flew. Yeah, that's correct. Um, yeah. So we'll just go right back to the start where you were born and where all the... The, the madness kind of started with you. Yeah. Well, I was born in a, a, a place called Cantine, east end of Glasgow, which was, as far as I was concerned, was one of the greatest places on earth. I didn't even really know nothing about poverty back in the day. You know, even although we were we were of, of poor stock, but, you know, you know, as a kid, you know, life was never poor. There were always plenty of things to do. Uh, and um, always up to mischief, which gone places where you shouldn't go, over the railway track, into the dog track. Or into um, the coal mines and you know coming back pot black and more gone mad. You know, stay to you need to <laughs> scrubbed up for school tomorrow. <laughs> but all all in all, life was good back in day in Canteen. My dad, my dad was a safe lord, and I never seen much of him back in the early days because he was always out in prison. And uh, when he did come home, uh, life in the house kind of took on a different reward because, you know. We, we, there was set times like, like you'd be back in here for seven o'clock and don't be doing this and don't let me catch you climbing dikes, you know, the high jumps and the, the old dikes back in the day. Don't let me catch you climbing drain pipes and don't do this and don't do that. And you're sort of, you know, man, life's no worth living with this guy. They say they don't, but that's when we tend to do Yeah, life's no worth living with this guy. He's worse than a turnkey. <laughs> and, uh, and only years later, you, you, when you sit back and you think about it and you analyse the situation, you, and the old man being in the, in the, in the probably regretting being where he was when you were growing up and no being there to be able to give you the proper guidance and try to guide you quick time when he came out, never knowing how long he was going to wait for, but try to try to hustle you and try to do things for you because he, he'd probably think, fuck it, I might not be here next week, I could be back in jail again and try and educate you and his way of thinking. But it didn't really work that way and it, and it, led, it led to a lot of, kind of heartbreak and disappointment, you know, I mean, for fucking 10 o'clock, you're in your bed at 8 o'clock at night, all your pals out in the summer night shouting off at the window, you coming out, or you couldn't get out for climbing a dike or jumping in a puddle, which was a natural thing to do for kids, you know. So I guess that, that was probably the start of, 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 of the downward spiral for me. Now I thought, to hell with this, I'm out of here. I'll wait the toilet, mum. Right, OK, don't be long, both right down the drain pipe and off. How many up? Uh, one up. Well, not there, probably, probably six, seven years of age. Right. I'm off to the toilet, mother, and gone and scared to go back home because you knew you were going to get lettered there. <laughs> and the days you got lettered, and, and, and there was no checks and balances to see how much you're doing, you were getting, you were, fucking, you, you were just getting a doing, and that was it. And I thought, never. So, you know, the other thing was then not to go back came and stay out all night, you know, realize the problems and the worry you're causing your mother and anybody else who's, who's concerned for you, you know. Whereas the old dies to shout, yeah, hope some fucker gets a hold of him and strangles him. And man's like, don't you ever talk like I'm, don't you ever talk about him like that, you know, that kind of thing. But the dad being the old hardened kind of criminal, yeah, he's a fucking no use of no days he's told and he never showed any love or affection, you know what I mean? But it was quite regrettable that I had to, had to run away from the house as many times as I did and uh, cause more trouble for myself and more problems for my mother. But back in the day, there was no, nobody else you could turn to. Mm -hmm. When was your when's the first time you get to jail? What age? Um, I think back in the day then it was I think it was ten years of age. Uh. You, you you had to be ten, nine or ten, I'm sure it was uh, before you could actually get get charged. So we had a good run, you know, right up to that that particular moment in time in life, because we knew that we could go out and do what we wanted and and, and never get away with it. Never get sent until you were ten. So you think your dad tried to give you the best life and. Uh, uh, that you could give and then yeah, in his in his fucked up he died uh, I, I can't believe that you know and, and my dad's fucked up he'd, because I tell you he was quite a fearsome guy and he was quite a quite a quite a reputation he was quite a smart looking and handsome mm. cunt he looked like he looked like Lee Marvin when uh, he was young and he, and he knew it you know what I mean he mm. knew it but um he he went a bit all wrong I mean the way he treated me as a kid try to put me on the straight and narrow and I was never. I've never done that with my kids because I knew what he was doing to me was all wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, but maybe maybe that was the only way he knew. He was maybe brought up. And, that, uh, and that's, what I, that's what I heard getting said one day. Uh, my, my old blind mother saying, what the fuck do you keep picking him for? He's only a win. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the way the fucking cookie crumbles and that's the way I was brought up. Mm -hmm. So it just kind of 
fell back on United. Think that kind of was a, the start for you to maybe yeah, definitely. cause the, the uh, madness. Definitely, and... yeah, definitely. Because he wasn't he wasn't a nice guy to be around, mm -hmm. but no, his pals fucking loved him. But when any his pals came up to the house, and uh, oh, I was a favourite all of a sudden, and I was shouted up for the back court. Come on up and meet so and so and meet mm. this and this and you have him on his knee and this is my favourite, isn't he? Was your dad feared? Oh, he was, was he? very much so I. But he would bounce me on his knee as if I was his prize position. But the minute the pals left to get my man fucking morning, you, you remember what I've told you about jumping in puddles and all I fucking and it ruined that, you know what I mean? It was just, it was well hit me he'd be a fucking truncheon. And back then in the day, but with his the street crime was it was rife back then a lot of slashings there was a lot of open razors wasn't it, it was a yeah lot but of... we were kids we, aye, were, aye, we, were, aye. we weren't we weren't involved we didn't know nothing about that back in the day but uh, we we eventually moved from from Camtown to a housing scheme east end of Glasgow mm -hmm. Gathamlock which was um, well, I don't I don't really know my impressions I can't think straight about the impressions when I first saw it. I thought maybe if, I said we sat up there mum she went what I said that there at the side of the house she went it's a veranda and I think the only time I've ever seen a brander was in fucking that program, Skippy. Uh, Skippy the kangaroo. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I was like, a brander? And the first thing I thought, I could, I could fly my deuce for there. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was like, you're not bringing any pigeons <laughs> in the houses. And that became, that became the place where we grew up. And, and uh, my mum didn't want to move to that particular house that my dad picked. And the reason being was uh, the number of the close was 999 Gatlock Road. Uh -huh. And my ma thought when the name steel and the number of clothes nine nine nine, you know, she thought it'd be bad luck mm -hmm. yeah, and she was, and she was bang on, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't know what kind of insight my mother had. I didn't really credit her for having a lot of insight back in the day. Because your man was your man and he and he he, he, he he thought he could pull a wool over her eyes right. and he wouldn't know any better. But she got that one right, she didn't want to go there. But there on the other hand, my dad, who had a strange sense of humour, he thought, yeah, that's not a fucking address. And, was the 999, is that the 666 kind of thing? It was the 666, but the 999, the police as Mark well, you know. Devil. So, it wasn't so much the Mark of Devil, it was Mer Merty David the, the police. police. And it became one of the most notorious dresses in Glasgow. And they yeah. got to the stage where they didn't even meet and give up. They just asked where you stayed, 999, and they knew right away. Who and, we, and we had a wee phone box outside, and you know, all police mm -hmm. boxes, the Doctor Who type, with one of them right <laughs> the blue ones. The, right, right, a blue one, right uh -huh. outside the front door. And, uh, and the scheme was beautiful back then, because a lot of people came for, for the East End, the, the, the slums. A lot of people came for the, for the slums, didn't they? These, these, you know, I think the scheme might have been about 10 years old uh -huh. the time we had moved there. Uh, and um, everything was green, there was trees everywhere, was hedges in every garden. Beautiful big massive gardens besides a football park, so it, so it seemed anyway. Uh, and... Uh, and all these lovely hussies and big rooms and inside toilets and the lights and um, these fancy middens around the back. I, I remember I got sent down to the midden with my dad and we were up cleaning, cleaning the house out before we moved in. She said, right, take that rubbish down to, the, down to the bin. So I went away down the stairs to the back court and I remember looking and saying, where the fuck's these bins? <laughs> I'm thinking they're all high dates for uh, way back in the day. But, so I left the rubbish and I run it, I've dumped the rubbish on the side. So he's I'm back up to this and he's like, I said, you get out in the bin all right? And I went, yes. And he went, he said, come here, you, you fuck pig. <laughs> that, 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 that was his favourite word. Come here, you, you fuck pig. pig. So he stood me on the sink and he says, where's the bins? So I'm looking and I can see all these, you know, he went, like, maybe about three, three feet higher. And I'm saying, that, and I thought they were sheds. I thought they were people's wee sheds, small garden sheds made of concrete. Mm -hmm. And I was through in that corner, he said, I said, I'm just standing watching you, Johnny. There's the fucking bin there. Get down there and pick that fucking rubbish up where you've knocked around the corner. <laughs> but I didn't know where the bin was. Uh -huh. But anyway, he's seen the funny side that only when he was telling his pals. Uh -huh. But it cost me a clout in the back of the head there. And uh, so we grew up in a wee place called Gathamlock. And Gathamlock being like m most other places in, in Glasgow, even more so the older places where we came from, there was never anything there for anybody to do. Uh. Mm -hmm. He'd maybe one row of shops, and every shop closed by five, five o'clock in the afternoon. And then after an ice cream band would make an appearance, you know, so that was your, that was your shopping centre. Mm -hmm. And um, there was no, there was no, there was, you're left to your own devices. There was no, no organisation. There was nobody there to organise. Uh, you you know, find a guidance to the end positive. 
until one day a, 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 a youth club opened up. But then the, the youth club, as much as the people in it meant, meant well, and some of them done really well, it became a gang hut, you know, because the gangs would all form up there and then the gangs would be formed all over that part of East End of Glasgow. You know, East House, Cranhill, Rikese, Balarnock, Cadoon. So my older brother Jim, they formed a, they, they formed a gang called um, the GYT, the Kasama Young Team. And um, somebody at the back end of the scheme formed a gang, um, the, the Bands Road Gang, and then we hear the, the East House of the East House Drummy and the Skinheads. And we had a quarry separating all these housing schemes. Mm -hmm. One big quarry. They used to they used to they used to blast it every every Saturday between the hours of one o'clock and two. And you could actually feel the, the, the hussies vibrate, you know, during the explosion period there. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's just where all the gang fights took place all in this quarry. You know, Gathamlock, you had the quarry, you got Gathamlock, Cran we were surrounded by everybody. Cranhill, Cran Black Hole, Cranhill. Rikese, Easterhouse, and Problem Mill. So we were, Gartie was kind of bang in the middle of it, so we ended up having to fight with everybody. And um, that was that was the start of the, the kind of gang warfare. You know, it was all chasing each other with bricks and flinging yeah, knives at the distance. And then for, then, for then on in, it kind of spiralled into a kind of more serious stuff. Um, we had a local copper. Uh, his name was Nero. His nickname was Nero. And... Uh, he 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 patrolled a, a greater part of that area, but in particular in, in uh, Kathamlock. And um, he was on the ball as much as he was a wee bit overweight. He was on the ball with it with, with eye like a hawk, and, and, and I don't know how he knew as much as he knew, but he knew quite a lot was going on. Uh. So when it kind of came, I was really anti gang fighting. To be honest, it wasn't my scene. My older brother was at the gym there, yeah, they, they end up they, they took the fights into, into the town centre. And they, and they, I remember one case in particular, and we're going back to 1969, where the Cathamlock boys went to Rovers in Socky Hall Street, and that became a kind of a meeting place for the gangs in the cafeteria. I don't know if you'll be familiar with it. And um, so all the gangs, it was just like the jail. The cafeteria became like the jail and, and the young offenders. Mm -hmm. You'd all the different rows, you know, the different guys from different areas, and, you know, and Paisley and Postal Mob and the Green Up Mob, and ten tables there and five tables here. And so the cafeteria and rules became became something similar. And uh, this is before I even went to the young offenders, before I even knew about the young offenders, I now realised that that's exactly how, how it worked out. My older brother, Jim, I think Jim might have been about 15 at the time. Uh, 15 Jim would have been. So they went into Rovers and they confronted um, the, the Cran Hall gang, Cran Hall fleet. And, uh, and, they, and they popped the steak knife out in the hatchets and, and, and the fight took place at the inside the cafeteria. And, it was, you know, and I always remember that part of the headlines, that the bayonets glistening in the sun in the town centre. And it was high court cases back in the days for that, that kind of thing. Yeah. And in the days, when they, when they first sat in every month in the high court, he had the wee judge sitting there in the middle with we wee wig mat on his wee tights. <laughs> and he had his two flunkies near her side with the wigs and the tights on. But they had the trumpets. They blew the trumpets for the first sitting. For people coming in? Ah, you had to, you had to stand in the high court. Mm -hmm. they was, they, before the trial actually started, you were on the dock mm -hmm. and over there. The wee trumpets would blow. They would blow a good <laughs> blast back in the day. I don't even know that. It was all psychological. Mm -hmm. It was all done to terrorise you and intimidate you. Yeah. And, and, and that's the way it worked unless you were a, unless you were a kind of gallus. Uh, gallus. Mm -hmm. But if you're a kind of, if you're a straight pig, man, mm -hmm. you'd know, just get the cuts in the confession uh, just to get out of there. What was your, what was your first sentence? First sentence, um, sent to a pro school, sent to an LSD a pro school, um, which was in Joseph's, which was run by the De La Salle monks. And the other old brother, we were talking about that earlier. Yeah, and uh, I haven't said that there was some civilian, civilian teachers there, uh, but it was overall it was a De La Salle brothers who who ran the show, and apparently that was for educational purposes. They were they were they got the license off the Secretary of State for Scotland to practice, but there was a lot of malpractice going back there in the day. Uh, you know, sexual abuse, kids getting battered and. And yet, same again, there was no checks and balances in any kind of place. There was nobody, you couldn't turn to anybody if you were assaulted or, you know. They believed you. 
No, not at all, no. So this was monks abusing Waynes Aye, sexually, yeah. physically? Aye, yes. And yes. this guy, we're talking about the new Oz, just got sentenced, is that right? 12, yeah, one, 14, of, yeah. one of the brothers, uh, uh, his name was Murphy. Um, he, they called him, he, he, his monk name was Brother Benedict. His proper name, surname was Murphy, but his nickname in the prayer school was Brother Bootsy. And he was like a, he was like a, well, I, I couldn't even really tell you what size he was back then, but because we were all, we were all undernourished and small, so he looked to me like a big six feet up, and he might have only been five feet four, oh. but he had, these, he had these boots, these boots with steel toe caps and the segs on them, and they looked exaggerated in size, as if they could have been made in John Brown's shipyard, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Massive. Yeah, they, they were really massive. Um his, his name is Brother Benedict, nicknamed Brother Bootsy, real name um, Murphy. Um, he went to court last year, I think it was, um, and received a seven-year sentence for, for assaulting kids, electrocuting kids. And, uh, For fuck's sake, how did that electrocute them? Well, what, my first encounter with him was, it was like a corridor, like we just come in here, James, and um, we were all going to chapel. We were all dressed for the chapel and by, and this brother had just started in there for the school. Yeah, he looked like a big Billy Bunter type guy, mm -hmm. you know, a big ho ho ho, mm -hmm. big in the glasses and mm -hmm. the big smoke glasses and a big ball face and the beard, big beard belly. And probably wasn't a beard, probably eating cakes or something. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, we were going by his corridor, we were going down the corridor and we were going by in his room in a pally mine. Uh, Tony Tamburini, who's now dead, and Brian McGacken, two of them now dead, said, Um, have you spotted what I've spotted there, Johnny? And I said, no, what is it? And he went, there's a, there's a tobacco tin lying on his desk. You know, the old golden Virginia oh, yeah, tobacco yeah. tins. And the old, the old, uh, the old lighters, the old cigarette lighters that your mum would have, a fancy looking cigarette, but they were petrol, eh? Ah, the big fuckers. So I've doubled back and I clocked it and I went, I said, just keep me clocking. So I was going on with tying my lace at the, right at his door. And he gave me the old clear. And I bounced into his room and to grab a tobacco tin. I think he fucking electrocuted. He had it rigged. He had that rig for underneath the, the table there. Oh, fuck's sake. And so he jumped out and he's let him stop lying in the flare, taking his basil and he jumped out. <laughs> he jumped out and let him back in here. My pal was pissing myself laughing. They uh -huh. bolted. Uh -huh. They're off. They're killing the snotters around there. They can't kind of stop laughing. <laughs> but anyway, that, that, that's how, that was the kind of things that he'd done. Yeah. Or else he would get other kids to hold those wire when he was putting the charge through it. Uh -huh. and, you know, must have, I don't know what was going through his mind. Are you the veins at this time? Well, we were all at tw 11, 12, yeah. And that's him just getting sentenced for 40, 50 that's, years ago? That's all came to late, aye. As people stuck him in, yeah. did they ever abuse you violently, physically? Yeah, what, see, what I just, the story I just told you, I wrote about it 30 years ago in my autobiography, word for word almost, uh -huh. what, I, what I've told you. And the only recently there that I spoke to a pal of mine who was in St. Joseph's just after I'd left there, and uh, he was talking about Brother Bootsy. I said, I've never seen that, and he went, Go and, go and get a newspaper for the library and you'll see it. And um, that's when I read that it, it finally caught up with him there. Who is he, Johnny? No? He must, be in, he must be in his 70s. And how did they know then about it the first time you wrote about it in your book? Well, you know, when I went to see the lawyer, when I went to see the lawyer about, because um, I, I put a report on about it, went to the police and put a report on, and um, the lawyer says to me, you know, I know you wrote about this, almost 30 years ago, did anybody ever approach you? And I said, nah, nobody ever approached me on any of this at all. She said, I find that, I find that amazing. I said, well, I, I don't, because back then, there was just, back then it's entirely different from now. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if somebody even got a slap in the school and then, man, it was a hullabaloo, do you know what I mean? And, and, and people took to task on it, you know what I mean? But I said, nah, that's just how it was, that's the way it was back then. In Lars Grove the Man Home, which was a notorious remand home for, for children, which was in Edinburgh Road in Lars Grove. Um he maybe maybe house maybe 150 guys and that young know, kids for for nine to, to uh, fifteen years of age. Uh, there was quite a lot of abuse going on in there as well. And uh, they held an inquiry. They held an inquiry into Lars Grove and run about 70, 73, 74. And um the 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 guy who headed the inquiry was one of the, well, the social worker um the education department in, in, in Scotland. He headed the inquiry. So out of that inquiry, 
that there was a regime change took place. They, 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 they figured that the regime wasn't gain society any benefits and, and a lot of the staff were replaced. There was some evidence of brutality, but nobody was ever charged and there was no evidence of any sexual assaults. So anyway, just about a year or two ago, I was talking to my partner and t- telling her about Larks Grove, you know, and it was much like an Oliver Twist scene, you know, the, the dining table and, mm-hmm. you know, and that, that's the way we all, the way you seen it in the Oliver film, they're all at the dining table, mm-hmm. that's the way Larks Grove was. You know, it wasn't it wasn't we be rooms in no. that, that that was the way it was and we had the short Old. trousers on. Yeah. I was showered together and fed mm. together and, and moved together, you know. Um but anyway I was looking through the, the internet and I says to my talking about Lars Grove, she says, I'm gonna take me down and show me it sometime, Johnny. Can I describe this wee window I climbed out when I was in there? But I had to I had to you know, I had to wait till I was in the shower. It was a wee, it was a wee steel wee steel frame. Four, four panes of glass in it. Probably one of the panes of glass about the size of that, that the, glass in the light. The light. Is this the YO's as well you try to escape no, for you? No, this is, this is I'm talking about Lars Grove, the man's right. home. I think it was only about 10, 10, 10 years of age I would have been. So I was in the shower and I covered myself in soap and uh, and get to the toilet and my pals lifted me up like a log and I managed to squeeze out the, mm. out the window. Uh. And you were 10? 10 years of And this is now. obviously... Uh, for every fucking jail you've been in, I think you've tried, you've, you've escaped, Aye. or you've tried to escape. But when they, when I climbed it the one day, you know, I had to climb this big, this, I don't know, it was probably about a fifteen feet pillar, you know, the one with the three spikes. Aye, 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 so aye, 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 fucking aye. dangerous, you know. And uh, I get out there and get away, and uh, snowing and away, headed home, and and finally get caught and took back and they were to me right. They thought I had a key in the back door, and I went. <laughs> I <was a> <laughs> How did you go? And I told them how I got. And they said mm-hmm. you couldn't. You couldn't go that mm-hmm. one day. So anyway, they, they made me go back up. And when they seen I could get my head out, they were in the garden and the squares were in, in behind me on the toilet. When they seen I could get my head out, and I was home when they popped me back in again, mm-hmm. and I was satisfied that I didn't need my key. But anyway, I was telling my partner about this particular escape, and she said, "I'd love to see this one day, Johnny." I said, "Well, I'll take you down because the large growth's still there. Mm-hmm. It's not a man home anymore." So I looked up the internet to show her some photographs and then I seen this, this headline uh, about Lance Grove, the man told an inquiry. Um, and in and, and, and the story, they were asking people who had made a complaint back in the 70s to come forward and uh, give a new complaint, to make a new complaint to the police because of the, uh, 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 the paperwork that had been lost. Here and here's, here's the cracker for you. And it turns out that the guy who headed the inquiry, the head social worker, it turns out, he, uh, this, this, is, this is in the newspapers, this is all the news, it turns out that he was part of the biggest paedophile ring in the whole of the UK and he had been on the radar away back in the day. 70s. Yeah, he'd been on the radar with the polis back, back in the day, you know. Although they didn't jail anybody back in the day, but they were on, they were on, the coppers were on to them all. And I don't think that the police could make a move on them because they were so fucking powerful. Mm-hmm. Because these, these guys that was in that position today, what they were doing, they were running the country. Mm-hmm. And look how long it took for the 70s to now to tell us to come to light, because they're all dead now. And that, that, That's how they can yeah, bring it all to light, but can it? Right, yeah. So that, that abuse inquiry is now reopened. That's now we'd open in Larch Grove, and um, I've been and I spoke to a lawyer about that one, and I've also been and spoke to a lawyer about when I told you about St Joseph's mm-hmm. for the for the sexual abuse and the physical abuse by the De La Salle brothers, uh. and uh, it wasn't it wasn't a very nice, it's not a nice it's no it's not pleasant it's no soothing to see somebody with a long black cloak because they just look like Dracula. I don't think mm-hmm. you ever. Seen anything like that with any Dracula movies? You should mm-hmm. <laughs> sitting right behind your ma watching it at the TV back in the day. So it wasn't, it wasn't very appealing. And plus, they were, they were kind of forceful with a, with a religious party that you think they, they thought we'd done something wrong that, that probably probably the devil was in you. And the idea that, that would be to beat them out of you. So just that creating be, fear with your mind to fuck did, up and you know, with a young boy. They really, they really, they really let a lot of people down in that whole system. Mm-hmm. You know, they, 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 and of course, the psychics of sake granted them a license to, 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 to preach and practice it. So all no, in all, you know, society society didn't benefit anything that society, you know, society lost it. 
But we were all let down with the whole system. Otherwise, we, we'd have put into a proper place with proper checks and balances mm-hmm. for that mate never took place. We could have turned our lives around about. And, mm-hmm. But as it turned out, we were running away from things that wasn't good for us. Do you think, obviously, through your upbringing then and then going through to their homes and, and going through the, the kind of torment and, and abuses is, was the start of just going, fuck yeah, it? Yeah, definitely, that was And that. no caring because you think yeah, nobody cares. It's, it's, and... no, it's not even a case of fuck it. It just becomes the norm. Mm-hmm. That... that what would what would be normal to me would be abnormal and horrific to, mm-hmm. to some some other some person who hadn't even known anything about her way of life. It'd be mm-hmm. quite shocking. But what was abnormal became a norm. How do you feel, Johnny, at seeing him in the papers and that then last year and going through? Yeah, no, I thought cheeky bastard. Cheeky, uh. cheeky bastard. How did you get away for all that time? How did they know if you put that out fair year ago, do you think that's because of the family history that nobody wanted to believe you or I wanted no, to look no. it up? No, no, I don't think it was the end of the day with, end of the day with the family history. I don't think it was a case of uh, nobody wanted to believe me. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I just don't know. And as I say, I became known as the most punished, or one of the most punished prisoners in the penal history of Scotland. And that was in my, that was during my, my period days. 80s. But I'm also, I was also one of the most punished guys way back today as well in the first school. And I, I, all I've ever really known, James, is punishment, crime and punishment. Mm. That's all I've ever known, and, and, and as much as I've ever tried to get, tried to escape from it, it's got me further and further in it. Your first big sentence, Johnny, was 12 years? 12 years, right. And you got that extended to 16, 17? Yeah, I got 12 years in 1978, for assault and robbery, me and a wee crew, a wee, a wee crew were running about, he just fucked up me, you know, just robbing, robbing this and robbing that. Back in the days it was dead men and ice cream mm-hmm. guys, you know what I mean? And... Um, I got 12 years for that. I was 22 years of age, like I said, it's a bit fucking, what a shock it gave me. You know, it blew me away, man, sitting in that dock, you know. Um, and I thought, fucking hell, man. And the crew was with me, four years. They all get fives and sixes, and, you know, nobody really thought that I get a 12 because of my my family background, my dad in particular, and the brothers. And um, that didn't even make any difference in why I got it. The mere fact that I got it, it totally destroyed me and I thought, fucking hell, man. I, I just couldn't see, my mind wouldn't let me see beyond that 12 years. I just couldn't see any end to it. And I thought all oh, the worst things were the negative things were through my head. Well, fuck this, man. My man's not going to be in like that. All my paddy's not going to be in like that. And life's going to be, my sister will be married. And you just couldn't, couldn't work that one out. And I thought, you know what, fuck this, man. I'm not hanging about. So my brother came up to see me, Jim, when I was in Berlinie. And uh, we, we, we plotted and planned an escape mm-hmm. uh, for, for me. Because back in the day when you, when you get took to, when you get transferred to Peter Heath Prison, um, you, you, you get notified. You get notified back in the day. You, you get noticed, you know what I mean? So you could get a visit for your family. And they would just whip you away, do you know what I mean? So back in the day, they took you away in the old jail bus, the old single-decker jail bus with the, with the bars. So but my brother put a pass out for me. And I put the pass up for my brother, sorry, and um, he came up I me mean, a couple with the crew. They, they were older than me. They were they, they were the wise guys, you know what I mean? I was just the fucking... Been there and done it. Uh, they were wise, you know what I mean? How many years of the difference? There's only 18 months for a difference, but Jim had been fucking... He'd been shaving since he was 14 years of age. I never shaved him for fucking 36, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, we were the... We were the mm-hmm. We were kind of, I don't know, probably the working the microwave mob, but even though we never had microwaves back in the day, but mm-hmm. the difference was he was more mature. Aye. You know, and he, he was, and he was well known, you know, received his reputation back in the days, you know. So we plotted the plan to escape for, for the for me to be broke out of the jail bus. I think they were going to hit the bus at um, steps steps because that's what it go. We go up to steps, then it would go out to Stirling to go to Perth Prison to trap and pick up prisoners, and then it'd make its way to Edinburgh to drop and pick up prisoners, and then it'd make its way to Aberdeen, and then Craig Aberdeen, um, and then Peter Heed. So anyway. I'm lying there and the night before, the night before I'm due to get transferred tomorrow, I'm all geared up, I'm all excited, and I thought, hey, fuck, I'm, and I thought, I'll fucking get 12, 12, 12 years, he's back. I'll, <laughs> I'll get him something to think about. <laughs> anyway, um, and, and back then, you had to, you had to, you had to be there 18, 18 months and over before you could get a radio one, and you had to be in six months before you could get the radio. So somebody shouted out the, the cell one day, mate. They said, here, Johnny, he said, something just came out of the news there um, on the radio. There's been a shooting in the, 
in the pub in the Sandlock, the barge. And I thought, never man, fucking. So I put two and two together, you know, I thought, fucking never man, because I knew they had the, I knew they had the guns for the, for the breakout there, and they were going to hold the, hold the yellow bus up there. So I thought, never man. Then it turns out that Jim had shot a guy, and my brother shot a guy in the pub, a gang fighter, shot a guy. Uh, I think a guy was in, I think a guy came in dressed up with somebody else, but he was going to try and whack one, one, of, the, one of the crew in the pub there, and uh, jumped in, done him, with, done him with two barrels of shotgun, you know. So I end up, yeah, he ends up on the run. I don't know where he, I don't, I'm not too sure where he went, but I knew he couldn't come and do what he was going to do. This was the day of the breakout? This was the day, this was the fucking night before the breakout, he shot oh, the guy, sick. yeah, and I thought, never, so there, I, there was me, I said, fuck it, I'll just, I'll just need to go and face it and, and try and get myself out there. So I arrived up in Peter Heed, and, a, and, and, a, and it's quite a fearsome place, Peter Heed, you know, and it's fucking, and it's reputation. His reputation was awesome, because that's why you don't, oh, you don't want to go near that fucking Peter Heed. There was a screw in Berlin, his name was Jim Watt. You could pay Jim Watt money. He was a, he was a, he decided who was going to be transferred to what prison and what, what party, right? This screw decided who was going where. So a lot of people who were on the draft, they go to Peter Heed when they were terrified. People were fucking terrified to go to Peter Heed for whatever reason of being, just because of his reputation or, or, or enemies, you know. And um, you could pay this screw, you know, up to two grand, for 1,800 quid dollars, actually. You could pay this screw, you get it, get it organised for him to go down and pick up money. And if you were on the draft for Peter Heed Prison, he could organise it that you could get transferred to Perth Prison or something there. But anyway, I wouldn't have never approached the cunt. Anyway, I wouldn't have offered them fuck on unless it was stitchy, you know what I mean? But, um, a, 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 a friend of the family, who's almost like I've got cousins, same surname, Steele, Joker Steele for, for Hamilton. Joker was in the, um, I think he was in a five stretch, Joker was then, And he finds that he's on the, on the draft for, um, for Peter Heed. And he can handle himself, Joker. He was a professional boxer, eh? And he, he just didn't want to go to Peter Heed. So he, He's organised his wife to make a meet with Jim Watt, the, the Blaney prison officer, right? And um, so the meeting takes place out at Joker's house in Hamilton. He'd bought a, he'd bought and bought a lot, he'd bought a bit of land and bought a beautiful bungalow. And his wife was a lovely, attractive looking lassie. So when Joe, when the screw comes, Jim Watt comes to to, to the house to to get the the eighteen hundred quid or, or what two grand or whatever it was. She felt uneasy. She felt uneasy when we'd been there and she, and she was kind of intimidated because she thought we would maybe fucking going to make a fucking sexual move on her. So she says, listen, I've not really got all the money to now. Can you come back come back here in a couple of days' time and I'll get it? And he said, oh, I thought I was going to pick up. She said, no, no, I'll need to bring the rest of it. I thought I had it here. So she went back up and she told Joker. Joker went, fuck him. Get the coppers involved. So... When he comes back to pick up what he thinks is the fucking 1800 quid or a couple of grand, the, she's wired up and the coppers are hell hiding mm -hmm. this, and they're all chinned in, they're all listening to it, and, and, and they pounced him, they got him. He got 18 months. He's in, he's in a jail with us, he's in 18 months, he's in the fucking, he's in the mailbags, I think we're with us, a fucking animal and all sort of sick. So anyway, that, cause that's a kind of reputation period, but you can fucking, buy, you can buy yourself out of mm -hmm. We gain this, this screw money, you know. I don't think everybody could have bought herself out of Peter Heath because there was places there that near a jail would, would, mm -hmm. would, would be capable of holding you. I mean, yeah, oh, fuck, aye, aye. anyway, true story. He got 18 months, and the uh, boxer still got sent to Perth, didn't he need to pay for it? Yeah. <laughs> so that was the kind of reputation Peter Heath had, and 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 uh. There was a myth about it that was for Scotland's most dangerous and hardened criminals. Whereas Bellini was full of fucking dangerous and hardened guys Aye. and soft and fucking tough. Zoo, it? Yeah. But Peter he'd been away up in the sticks and you know, back in the day, there was no, there were hardly any Glasgow mm -hmm. turnkeys up there. It was all big fucking troopers, all big Highlanders, Hamish and fucking Callum and you know, big fucking big Aye, seven feet big guys, no, big, big fellas, no. And um, so I remember riding up in the jail van, and all the way up in the jail van, I'm still expecting my brother to <laughs> tap on me, fall over. Anyway, that didn't happen, so I went to Peter Eden and, and it was, 
to, to take you through into the reception, you're into the punishment block, not a fucking big sign up, silence, no talking, and all these fucking big sonsy looking faces looking at you and fucking, you know, and that is, that, they had this thing about Glasgow people, James, man, the screws that they, that, that, that they particular warders up there. They thought we were all, they thought we were all fucking animals. Which is true, Major. They thought we were all animals, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I remember sound tech on the screws, you, you can't, you fucking, you know, read. And uh, he pointed to that sign. And, uh, oh, and I could see the shoes outside the cell doors. Even when I arrived there, so I knew that they, 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 that's the cells and the punishment blocks separated for the rest of the jail. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a wee jail with that, just at the side of the jail, it's in wall and it's in doors, you know, and, and there's three pens in it and there's a, there's a walkway where the screw can come out a door in the middle flat and walk on the, the planks and look down, in the, look down into the pens. Oh, I can see into the cells, aye? No, no, the exercise pens, right, right, right. He's, on a, he's on a walkway. So he's high above you and he can walk down. Oh, the middle, yeah. He can walk right down the site and look into the pens and mm -hmm. make, you know, just to see you're right. okay and I've got the bad wire on and the place, you know. But anyway, that was such a place with Peter Reid that had a fearsome reputation and I can you understand I'm alive and I'm only 22 and I'm fucked up in the evening. I'm ready mm -hmm. to go. You know, I don't think I'm anybody. I don't if anybody I'm, says anything to the fucking done plug them. No, or? I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. Escape. To the wall. I'm ready to fucking cause it. Where no. did that come from? They constantly trying to escape and looking for things to get out. I don't know. I've done it all my life. I've been fucking doing this in Lars Grove and fucking <laughs> honestly, fuck man. So I'm trying to tell you, so fucked up neither of us as a kid. You know that. But anyway, when I arrived there, and, and, and most of the guys that was there I'd met was a kid because we were all pals with my dad, and I'm not fucking see these guys, and I'm saying, where the fuck hang with these cunts, man? I said, how are you no right? And, oh, fuck that right, carry on. And now up there for thinking. <laughs> Down there for kicking in jeweler's windies. <laughs> and, I, and I couldn't even work it out. I'm saying, fucking, you're just fucking screws are all terrified. I'm a wee skinny cunt, man. Mm -hmm. They're, they're going to kick me about. And I'm like, mm -hmm. fucking screws are all terrified. You use my, you can make changes like that. Mm -hmm. Nah, that's not the way you do it. You know, the old school, fucking yes sir, no sir, three bags full, sir. Mm -hmm. I mean, fuck that. But anyway, that 12 year sentence fucking pummeled me into the ground. And I thought, never, I'm never going to get through this. And I believe in my heart that if I'd have made an attempt, you know, a serious attempt to get, and I did do it one and fucking, I was going to hang myself, I just couldn't face it. And I thought, mm. I can't do this, man. And I was terrified to fucking hang myself. Terrified to, because I knew then that, that it'd be like shrapnel coming off a fucking bomb and it would affect all my family. Aye. And it's fucking hard, do you so know you what I mean? contemplated suicide, didn't it? Fucking hell, man. I fucking, I was going to ask him, I was going to press the bell, so you're going to get me the fucking nose. Mm -hmm. Then I thought, never mind, I get the fucking nose, I'm never going to get back out. Now fuck it, I'm going to hang myself. Now, fuck it, no, I can't do that one. Fuck it, I'll escape. And that, and that was what fucking kept me on the straight and narrow. So anyway, I arrived there and, and I'm like, what's going on? And I hear about the cell block. And I'm becoming terrified to go to the cell block. And I'm going to go to Peter Heed. And I'm saying, what the fuck are you doing there? They fucking, they fuckers, man. They, they, they don't take any shit. You can't go to the window. You can't talk or shout or nothing. So anyway, I first got arrived there. I bumped into an old pal of my dad's, a guy called Sonny Leach. And I say, says, Sonny, I need to get out of here, Sonny. And he went, fucking hell, young man. He says, you get here, he says, you shouldn't even fucking be here. And I shouldn't have been there, James. I'm fucking, no, I never, I never done. I'm fucking, wasn't a violent guy. Uh, I never fucking stabbed anybody uh, or shot any cunt. No, I read just that a, in your book that it was, was all just a fucking, crime, aye, just fucking it? just a thief, mate. Mm -hmm. Stealing was my sport. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the damage I've ever done was to people's property, grabbing through the fucking so walls. So that's where the king uh, escaped. Kind of route comes yeah, around because they're always looking for I was some avenues. grafter. I could, I could graft through any fucking wall with any weapon <laughs> when it came to him and it came to breaking into places uh. and breaking out, you know. So anyways, um, I arrived there and an old pal of my dad says to me, you know back in the day in the Admirality, Johnny, way back in the day, he says, um, the youth, because it was the, the French prisoners and Napoleonic prisoners that that built Peter, he built the breakwater at least. Mm -hmm. They built the breakwater at Peter, he so they used to bring the prisoners underground and they and they Peter Heed when they come off pardon me, they come off the boats back in the day. He says, So there's a tunnel out there in the football field. Well the football field was called the uh, the Burma Road. You've got Peter Heed, you've got the football field, you've got the works, and you've got the exercise yard and Peter Heed itself, you've got a big massive wall separating the field and the uh, uh, the rest of the jail. If you're a category prisoner, you wouldn't allow it in the football field. So anyway, I was out one day, and a guy says, "Wait, I found, I found the drain. I found this. Cause we're a big pole, need this." And we, uh, 
back in the back in the day, we used to wear it was all kind of ex-military. There were a lot of ex-military uh, coats. Peter had been Peter had been freezing up there, frozen in the fucking winters especially. They had these moleskin duffel coats, which belonged to the staff sergeants during the war, the Second World War. And you're talking, they buy one now, we're talking about fucking 1800 quid, mm -hmm. pure proper moleskin. Eh? So we'd all these big duffel coats, and we had this big long, we got this long rod. And this pal of my dad, he was running about the football field to try and find out this, this big drain they used to work in when he was away back in the day, but it was all covered there in grass and, and whatever else. But anyway, I found this fucking thing. So anyway, I've got it, it's a big fucking, it's about half a side, the slabs move a bit, that. Yeah, so all the guys out in the football field, so I've managed to get done now. I've got the slab up and the guys are standing in front of it, they've got their duffel coats on, they're all kidding on, they're cheering on the football, you've got two teams, the hams and the bams, mm -hmm. are called that. <laughs> Who's so, the bams? Uh, just the just, name? Just, um, just, uh, you can play for the bams, uh -huh. one day and the hams, and uh, it, yeah. And, uh, so anyway, I, and I'm doing there and I've sussed this fucking thing, and it's quite big, it's, Probably about the size of his room, doing I can do these steel ladders there. And, uh, and it's and it bricked off, you know, and there's, 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 there's a crisscross pipe. You know, there's pipes down there, crisscross, big fucking pipes. And probably about, maybe about, I don't know, say 20 feet, 20, 20 feet behind me, there's a, the jail wall. But back in the day, the jail wall was only, only six feet high. And the screws, kids in the quarters used to sit on top of that wall. And watch the watch the cons playing football back in the fifties and that. Eh? So anyway, the brick tore us off inside. So I, I I figured out what I need, and I've got a fucking wee, made a wee lamp, and I've got a couple of tools for um, certain works, certain work parties, and he'd cut prisoners. So anyway, a couple of weekends I'm doing that. I can only get done on a Saturday or a Sunday. So I'm grafting through through this wall, you know, with the pipes going through. Cause I'm led to believe that this is the tunnel wall bricked up. But I've also noticed that the pipe running towards the punishment block for where, I can, where I'm standing. So anyway, I'm doing there, the following weekend I goes down, and, uh, and I'm normally I could hear what's going on, and I've got to, I've got to bang, I've got to bang to let him know I'm coming up. Because I've got to come up, and I've got to put my back, I'm on the steel ladder, and I've got to put my back against it, on this big fucking slab. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I'm up the ladder, and I go ding, 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 and I don't hear nothing, I've got up a wee bit, and I still can't hear nothing, what the fuck's happening here, man? So the next thing I hear, the jingle of the keys, I hear this fucking screws keys, I hear the chain, I hear the big boots on the concrete, and I went, never, man, fucking never, done, fucking done it. You're joking. No, we hear this one. <laughs> so anyway, I'm like, fucking never, so I went, fuck it, man. I said, I'll just go up, and I've lofted this fucking thing up, and I've come out like that. Because I think I'm going to scalp the attention. Mm -hmm. I'm covering, trying to cover part of my, my skill, skill, you know what I mean? So I've got this thing up and I'm looking, looking down. And I went, mean, the fuck is everybody? And they'd be there. Looking on the they, 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 they've all escaped. <laughs> <laughs> the fuck, we all went to any screws, any nothing. So I've got out and I've looked down, looked down the park and the big, big, massive steel gates that lead for the, for the jail exercise yard and halls into the, into the football park. And I think to myself, fucking never man, what's happened? I see the screws down there. So I've crawled out and I've flown to the toilets. There's a, a wee set of fucking mm -hmm. filthy toilets there. And I thought, fuck it. I've roughed all my hair up and I've popped my... And I've, I've already got scrapes on me. I've left in this big fucking... This big concrete slab so and it's fucking freezing. I've got fucking scrapes all my hair. So I've got to the toilet and I could hear them. I could hear them shouting. I was looking one down on the counter shouting. And I went, never man. So when I walked in towards the gates and I've made a noise with the gravel and I've looked down. They went, oh, daddy's there. And he shouted to her, shouted to this other cunt. Yeah, he was so okay, we'll go home. So this screw went like to me, said, Christ, Loon, where were you? So I changed my story at the last minute. I didn't even realise it was so fucking cold that they all got took in. Mm -hmm. So I, I, rung this, I was going to say I was fighting my cunt in the toilet and I was in there cleaning myself up. Mm -hmm. I mean, I fell asleep. He went, what? What, Christ, oh, Mick, he said, it's a wonder you never did. <laughs> <laughs> fucking fate below I zero. You. No, I'm here, this one. <laughs> ah, he, he believed me. This cunt was called Cement. He'd end up with a poem about him. <laughs> he said, Christ on Mickey, man. He says, uh, you could have deed out there. So this wee, this wee chief, this wee guy called David Murison. Now he, I know all about him before I go there. 
could have been told that he was in the, when my dad was in Perth prison and Murison was there, my dad had an open visit with my younger sister Brenda. Because back in the days, and that was the glass and the and the and the and the, and the, and the wire mesh. You know, that only all changed somewhere in about the mid mid seventies or something. Now, that. that's how your visits all took place. There. But anyway, my dad gets an open visit. I'm talking before for my time in jail. You know what I mean? And uh, I think in Murison, I think the chief was being a bit derogative or been sniping with my dad. So my dad waited to go back to the hall. And he grabbed him with a scruff of the neck and put his finger up his ass and ran him right round the gallery you know, to, 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 to humiliate him, do you know yeah. what I mean? So anyway, he's came in the gate and the screw's like, we got gang of one there, he says. You got frosty bloody death, lad. So he's well that. Muris is well that. Hold it, he says to me. He went to the screw, he says, where was he? He said, oh, he fell asleep up there. And then Muris went, fell asleep, he's fucking five below zero. Mm -hmm. you, you, you're telling me he <laughs> fell mm -hmm. So he went, go and show you why you were sleeping, and I realised I'd fucked it then. <laughs> Dad didn't, because the referee, the referee was the biggest grass in the jail, a big guy called George Drummond. Mm -hmm. And this comes like a scene out of porridge, this can't get anything in the jail, mm -hmm. but you couldn't tell him what you're up to. So he's a referee, the, and he's a professional referee, and life is guy, he did now. So I don't know that he blew the whistle to get the fucking football teams are freezing to get took back into to the holes. And I'm still doing the fucking, I'm still grafting down there. So the guys can not mark my cards. It's good, the well, fucking whole place is shut down, the fucking freezing to death. And I thought, fucking never, man. So anyway, he goes back to me, where were you? I went up there sleeping. He went, I, I don't believe that. Lock him up, lock the jail up, he's shouting. Lock up, no, no, the jail was already locked up, can I really one down the count? Lock the fucking whole place up. So they've got me to the cell block. And I can hear the guys shouting at I see the guys that knew mm -hmm. that I was doing there, and the guys would you know, kind of help me. They are all shouting, what's happened with what I looked up for? And I can hear the cunning and all that. And the, the mole's been caught, they're shouting. <laughs> and that, and that was meant to be the code, uh -huh. that. So this group called Bert Young, who, who seemed to be an all right guy, you know what I mean? For somebody who worked in the punishment block, who was meant to be all bastards, you know what I mean? He's opened the door and he went, never, you hey, fuck it. He says, freezing, he says, sleeping. He went, do you know what they're calling you up there? And I just like fucking daft. I said, nah, I'm not going to give a fuck. What they're calling me, mate? They're calling you in the mole. Because the cons are all shouting at the windy or the halls each other. And the fucking screws are all listening in. So you're getting, they're stacking in, basically? Aye. So anyway, the the, the, the chief came back in and like, he said, nah, nah, nah. He says, you're up to no good. And I said, I'll tell you the truth, I was fighting. He went, well, you must have marched when you saw some of them as fucking big greys. I had to come out that as fucking big slab with some weight. I was a wide and strong cunt, you know what I mean? But I didn't realise it was fucking that big. So I went, I don't want to believe this one. So I'm going to surge the guy and he's well like, and that's an old one. It fucking froze over. <laughs> <laughs> it just looked like an old one. It totally happened. Anyway, next thing the governor comes in, Andy Gallagher, who was known as Slasher Gallagher. Andy Gallagher, one, in fact, you know, when they say Peter was for most dangerous fucking criminals and this, it all that applies for the screws and the fucking governor. Because Andy Gallagher, and the nickname is, is, is taking people's square goes. He would, he would go for a fight with you. And he uh, had quite a fearsome reputation, oh Andy. But the screws also feared him as well. He, he was a strict, strict cunt all around. You know what I mean? Nobody, nobody escaped him. So anyway, he comes in, he's fucking barging into my cell in the, in the punishment block. Hat off. Through the hat, I've just been disturbed with my fucking tea on a Sunday afternoon, a Saturday or Sunday afternoon. I said, I've been just been disturbing my sleep. I turned me out in the face. He said, don't fucking try and give me that shite. So, they went away and they've come back and they've caught me, they've got, they've got me down at the order room. They went, right, we know what you're up to. Uh, we found the tunnel. We found, the, found where you were. They found the fucking, the miner's lamp was down there and the fucking crowbar was down there and, and, and the wee, the wee eyes and ends was down there. <laughs> He went, right, you know, you're up to and the governor's like me, and I fucking know who put you up to it, and don't fucking tell me it wasn't it, it was the steels or the paddings, my mad brothers, because mm. they, they, they had all the reputations, and I went, ah, I don't know what you're talking about. So anyway, I, I got a visiting committee for that charge, which meant that they brought three kind of local shopkeepers in for, mm. for, for the area, mm -hmm. you know, period area, maybe retired shopkeepers, but, you know, decent, hard-working people, you yeah. know. And they became part of this committee, which they didn't probably know that they were really letting themselves in for. But this was just, the, this was just their way of taking me out of mission after you, be using 
but they would call a visiting committee who were just made up the ordinary people. You know, they were fucking sheriffs. You know, it was different for or, uh, barristers or anything like I mean, just ordinary people. Anyway, they've got me in the order room and charged with attempt to escape. And um, so they've got a big map out. They've got a map. So the we one went like, where exactly was he going? They went, right, they've got a big map out. So I'm tuned in, I'm focused on it. And Andy Gallagher, the governor, looked up and they went, we need to remove the prisoner. So they discussed what they discussed and called me back in and they... So they went, right, okay, well, we're quite happy that you, 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 you attempt to escape down the tunnel. And, uh, and you should be thankful that the officers got you when they did get you. Could have a rat's down there when they got you, you know, you know, shit, and the rats right. they got you, uh, you'd, have been, you'd have been a sorry lad. And, and you're only young, and uh, I think we should give him a chance. So that was um, 60 days of mission and uh, solitary confinement and, and the punishment block, yeah. So anyway, I arrived in the punishment block after that, the screws like mattress suit. In the morning, you're talking fucking it's half past six in the morning, door open, mattress out. You're only allowed one blanket in during the day. Mattress out and books out. You've only allowed a book into eight to five o'clock. Anyway, I've had any bother. And she came in five o'clock. Right, get your mattress in. So I put you the piss pot. The piss pot had a plastic chamber pot. Put you the right in the fucking galley. I said, I don't want nothing. I don't even want the fucking mattress. You keep the fucking mother over teaching. <laughs> so you keep the matters, keep the piss pot, I don't need nothing off yeah. you. So anyway, and to me that was better than them coming in and disturbing you and fucking your head up at seven o'clock in the morning. Aye, I mean, so better. Slave. Yeah, no fucking. So back in the day in the in the, in the punishment block, the beds were made of, they were made of maybe uh, maybe two inch or an inch thick um oak and they had hinges and the the the, the, the hinges you, you had the hook but you had to put your bed up during the day, working hours during the day, you get to have your bed pinned to the wall with a big hook, so you couldn't sit in your bed, you couldn't sit in your bed during the day, that was to five o'clock, you know. Where did you sit in the flare? Yeah, that was the idea, you sit in the flare, right? Is this all the confinement? It's all the confinement, right. Fuck's yeah. sake. What were you in there for? Went all in, for you know, five, six years or something. Fuck's sake, so Johnny. Right? Yeah. Aye, but that was, that, was, that was in the early days. But I changed the whole fucking the whole prison system. I wrecked the whole punishment block, so it, it all became different for for the time. We worse, you know what I mean? Wrecked it in what way? Did you get smash it up or did you get? Uh, did you protest in that? Yeah, all the time. Did you do the dirty protest? Was uh, it Danny? Was it who's it Danny Boyle? Me, me and just who's the good. man? Danny Boyle? Was it Danny Boyle? The who's the guy? Was oh, it? Jimmy. Jimmy Boyle. Aye, Danny. Aye, but what we done when we were on the dirty protest? We took the protest outside. We had the screws with it, mm -hmm. and we put it in the. Put put it put the shit into the, the keyholes. <laughs> Run the hall to the door. Did he? Aye, oh, aye, oh, aye. And they uh, only went into the other room. We left the screws kettle and bang the shit in there. And <laughs> fling, fling, fling a shit at the screws. You know, there was a time when they brought a they brought a body here to Ireland. Um, because the screws didn't know how to, they couldn't cope. With it. They never mm. seen nothing like it mm. on the mainland, you know. And um. They, they didn't they didn't know how to cope so they brought they brought a, a body over for the island that the, the prison prison department mm -hmm. and um apparently I found out later on that they didn't they'd never seen anything like it either they said when we were dealing with the IRA and the, and the, and the dirty protests they were smearing it on themselves and on the, on, on their walls inside of it fuck you stop somebody coming out and flinging fucking shite bombs at a 30 feet <laughs> ceiling they were clinging all the place <laughs> or even and we were going to see the governor and there was a big bandit screen up mm -hmm. so we couldn't hit him up. couldn't hit the governor you know but there came a stage that the screws went in strike at one particular time mm -hmm. as in we're no fucking coming in here to work anymore as in the punishment block because it was bad you know what I mean shit and the way sinks because we tore the sinks off and bust the fucking pipes and just what were you doing it for? just fucking well, you know, always trying to get things changed yeah the thing was that, that was their pride and joy wasn't it the punishment block mm -hmm. I mean that was their pride and joy and uh, there was fuck all he could do us and we were, fuck, mm. we were we were just fucking we were just born rebels, you know what I mean? And mm. and to us, to us that was a challenge, man. You know what I mean, and just and was it that a fun fees and all. It had to be. You had to have a sense of humour, James, mm. in there. You know, Shit bombs. I, I remember. <laughs> I'll, give you, I'll give you an example, right? A wee pal of mine, he's dead now. Guy called Frank McFree. Frank was quite intelligent, ah, very very witty. So we our wee crews they always get together. Many time we can we always talk about plot and plan to escape or riot. Ah. So anyway, there was a particular time we're on the dirty protest in Peter Heed. So we've not got any Wendy's, we've smashed all the fucking Wendy's out. Mm -hmm. So we've made hammocks out of the bed sheets. <laughs> and that's how we communicate. What a luxury, you know? fucking. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, 
we're talking about escaping, and um, so there's me, Frank McPhee, Archie Steen, my brother Jim, a guy called Breeny for Black Hill, we Smiddy for, for Barrafield. Were you and your brother Jim? Aye, Jim, me and Jim escaped together, and I. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, with this wee fella, Tam Cameron, we Smiddy, they were, they were a couple of years younger than me. And as much as I thought I was fucked up, they were even more so fucked up, because they'd never, they'd never got away from that young offender mentality, you know, because they'd done too long and never mm-hmm. never had the break, you know what I mean? Whereas when I was in jail, I was learning all the time and, and listening to the older school, you know what I mean? That was your, that was your education, you know what I mean? And uh, so we're talking about we're going to escape, and we're talking about coming back and killing screws here. I mean, we're talking, we're, we're just talking it one day openly. Yeah, fuck it, we go. We'll just come back and we'll murder them. We're right in the house, we'll kill the fucking the wives, wains, grannies, for grandas, sake. budgies, hamsters, and <laughs> it's fucking madness. But mm-hmm. it was really fucked up in the heat, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So, yeah, two guys down the road, two, two, two cells down. They were talking about when we get to Peter Heed, they were going to steal, steal, a, steal a couple dozen cars and put it run a put it round the off sales, one of the Agnews fucking off sales, mm-hmm. one of the Agnews aye, off aye. sales. Like a wagon train, you know, the cowboy and Indian style. And they were going to torch on the motors and they said, we'll drink ourselves to death before the country can get it. <laughs> <laughs> so we were all killing myself laughing. And I'll never forget what Frank McPhee says to me, he says, Johnny, and we ever get away from here. We can't take these cunts ways. Man, you'll murder every cunt. You'll just yeah. slaughter, and they would have. And you weren't like that because you were talking about robbery and stealing and yeah, we were talking about robbing banks and fucking. Mm-hmm. They were talking about getting murdered and fucking. Oh, Jesus mm-hmm. Christ! But you know, that Fuck's Frank sake. McPhee says to me, "Could you imagine the BBC hiding outside your cell one day's right now, going like that? The public shh, listen to these. You'd be locked up. We can never allow these people. Uh, to watch white jackets on. That, and, that, and that's what the jail done to you, uh, James. Aye. And you'll fuck your head up because so if you're surrounded by that environment, but you kind of you're learning for each other, but it's no it's no positive. You probably get the odd one or two who they change yeah. and go right, yeah. fuck this isn't it for me. Yeah. After your first stunt in the jail, did you get when your brother Jim? Because he he was only confused, Jim, only twenty five years. Jim, Jim, Jim come in six months after him. Yeah, was that for the ice cream things? No, Jim got done for shooting the guy. That was my other brother Joseph. So, so the Jim, one that was the one before you t- tried to escape. No, Jim he, was the one that was going to break me out of the jail uh-huh. bus. He got 12 years for shooting a guy in the pub, and Joseph was the other one who got done for ice cream, was the one I broke out of his and, and broke him back in to Blinney. So, Jim, what did he get for the shooting? Jim got the same as me at 12. And that was the one the day before you t- he tried to break you out? Aye. So, you were in together? No, no, sorry. But we were in together, but Jim was in Blinney untried. Right. So, he waited in a three, four month for his trial to come up. Right. But he got done. He, he shot the guy the night before he was going to break me out and the next day at the jail mm-hmm. bus for the transfer to Peter Heath Prison. For that. He waited in the untried in Malini, I think it was uh, four months or something later, Jim got a 12 stretch. So when Jim came up and we, we were kind of baffled, you know, we, we thought, you know, Peter Heath's full of tough cunts and the fucking most dangerous and we thought, well, we've got a good fucking, well, let's try and organise an escape and a right here, mm-hmm. know what I mean? And talking about the brutality and the punishment block, you know. So anyway, we decided we were going to riot up in, up in, in, the, in the punishment block. Um, it was about 10 years, and we're off of Glasgow. Mm-hmm. So we storm, stormed right up through through the, through the skylight and battled all the fucking windows and got down and chased all the screws out. So we've come and did that. We've took control of the punishment block. That was a pride and joy, yeah. And um, we've got a couple of prisoners, and, and so we've, we broke a few of the prisoners out, yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, we sold a couple, we, we trade, I'll tell you who was there. Um, you remember the Custers, Kerry on the Custers murders? McCulloch and Moan. I can't remember them. No, yeah. you remember? Oh, see these, oh, see these cunts escaping to help three coppers, none of the copper in, in the place, in the grass. Mm-hmm. See these bastards, you know. So one of them was in the punishment block, so we sold that cunt. We didn't even want him out anyway, you know, he was a fucking fruitcake. You sold him for what? Tobacco and fucking soup. <laughs> <laughs> the screws are the back and soup. Aye, we sold them uh-huh. the screws the screws they couldn't get to get them uh-huh. and they were terrified we were going to break them out because we'd already broke another couple of oh, crackpots right, right. you know so we took these ones up on the roof and showed them off we've got were you the ones that were on the protest for, on the roof the... we were the first riots aye, we, we, aye, we aye, were the right. very first riot mm-hmm. up there uh. so anyway the screws are saying right we fucking need we, can, we, need, we need to get him out we can't let that come to the roof he's a maniac so we're a battered fuck, because we're having running battles with the screws, we're soaking. Because mm-hmm. we're, we're in the punishment block, which is also the reception. So every time they put the hoodies on us, we've even been doing into reception and putting on suits and ties and all around clothes. And, and um, so then we sold that, we sold um, McCulloch, we sold him for a cartner, a Dixie, a suit, 
um, bandages, um, I don't know, a couple of pounds of tobacco, a sweeties, toffee, fucking Mars bars, and you name it. But, but we got what we wanted, we done the trade, we were just too happy. They, so we let them in, we let these cunts in to fucking to take, take this particular prisoner out, which they were quite happy to do. So how was he about when you were trying to trade time? How was he? He feeling? didn't want it. We, 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 we went to his bar and said, Right, you're coming out, and he's like, I don't want nothing to do with it. You're like, fucking having a laugh, mate. Fucking, you're enjoying the fucking crew, man. Fuck's sake, don't want nothing to do with it. And this is the guy who's done three, four murders? This is a guy, this is a guy who's in Castell State Hospital. And while he was in Castell's, where he shouldn't have never been, when he was in Castell's, him and his pal plotted an escape. And, um, and during the escape, they killed the night shaft. They killed the screw on the night shaft, and then they got the keys off the screw and broke into the into a cunt cell. And murdered him because he was a grass, you know, one of the guys. And then they got out, they murdered the copper, two coppers. They murdered the copper, uh, and, and the, the other one, the, the other copper, he he managed to get away. But they murdered the copper, three murders they done. And uh, they caught him in a farmhouse somewhere, running about Scotland, or was it England, we're still sure. But anyway, serious dangerous bastards, oh, fucking the whole place was up. Because uh, Castell's State Hospital, Turnkeys, nurses are all part of the POA. Mm -hmm. You know, fucking they were being for blood. So it, really, it turns out that the fucking two mental cases that escaped from fucking Castells were now fucking fit to, to insane to be fucking mm -hmm. come prisoners. So anyway, they kept them locked up. So anyway, when he spied on us, he said, We're okay, we're going to get you, get back for the door. But he didn't even want it. I don't know if he was paranoid, he was going to get fucking murdered or whatever. But we ended up, we traded him. For much needed food, because all our food was fucking soaked. I mean, what, they, what the screws had done, they had um, they called the fire brigade in, and they, they were trying to, try to flood us out, you know, and they really they, they did, they done a very good job of it. One of the cells we brought this guy, this particular guy called Dadger, we fucking, he was done for murdering a wee, wee midget in Clyde Bank. We broke him out, but before we could get him out, the, the hoses, they concentrated the hoses on, on his cell one day. It was another fucking fruit. I'm terrified of this guy. They concentrated the hoses, the power hoses, on, on his cell. So he was he was up to here in water. <laughs> he was swimming about his cell. So we got into the loft and uh, there's a wee, there's a wee ventilating system there, kayak, fucking ventilating system. One there for cold air and maybe one down there for, for hot air. Eh? So it's got a grill on it. So we smashed the grill. And if your arm was long enough, and my arm, and I was up in the loft, and my arm was long enough, and two of us could touch hands. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we got these big bars. We say, so I smashed the fucking grill off, and uh, we, we, threw it, we passed him an iron bar down, so it fell right down. And he's got the iron bar in his peter. But he started smashing. He was meant to be digging. He was meant to be digging in, digging the door for the inside for us to help, because we were grafting for the outside, mm -hmm. big fucking thick steel doors, you know what I mean? The kind of block, yeah. Then this crackpot started smashing his windies and shouting to the street, I'll fucking kill you, eat your liver and you know, I fucking see these maniacs, see these murderers, chopped a wee midget up this cunt, you know what I mean, bits. Fuck's sake. So the screws concentrated the hoses on them. But we only found out through a radio report that they had to bring the fire brigade in to pump more water back into the jail because they'd pumped all the water that was already into the jail into, into the fucking punishment block to try and get us out. So we were up there for five days and five nights, see. And... Um, they brought in the Secretary, Secretary of State for Scotland came and his name was Malky Rifkin. And a wee lawyer from Peter Reed Prison came in and he was guaranteeing everybody that uh, all would be well because none of them would be no brutality. So anyway, uh, somebody shouts down to me for the punishment block, your mother's on the front page of the, the fucking Daily Record, Johnny, uh, saying, I know my boys are no angels, but are no animals. And she's talking about brutality. And um, so anyway, they've got the Secretary of State in and he's fucking, he's in the exercise. We're all on the roof, we're all up there fucking yeah. rioting for five days. We've been there five nights, you know, shouting for better conditions, shouting about the torture going on in the punning block. Cunts get locked up for years and fucking brutalised, no fucking bed up during the day, bed fucking bankers out during the day. And so anyway, the governor, Governor Andy Gallagher, he's just back to Strasbourg. He's telling us what big changes are going to come. And you know the sad and tragic thing, James, the changes that he was talking about to me in 1979, right, the changes that was going to be coming, 
I've only just came in the last five years. Forty years ago. Yeah, he said, changes are coming. He says, you know, know this prison system, big fucking changes are coming. And when they cook, cook, when they fucking riots there, the food, the food's shite, because it's all outside caterers. Visiting scenes are going to be different with caravan and fucking conjugal visits and open visits, family visits. And, oh, it's all about helping the prisoner now. <laughs> Fucking 40 year on, and all, they all just came about. That's your first big sentence. That's your first big sentence. That's it, I can't hang about when fucking you come up with change. Years. It's not going to happen now. I'm out. Is anyway. this all happening in the first big sentence? The 12? This is my 12, my 12. So they come in, and he's on, we're on the roof, we've got all the brick. We've got all the bricks down, all that kind of brick, yeah. We, a little bit of these made the granite inside the, the, the punning block. They've got the loft, but it's made of that kind of brick. So we've got all the brick for ammunition, yeah. So no, no screws can really try to ram us, yeah. Fucking. They've come on up the them, right in the country and stare them, big iron bar and bashed them and fucking stole their riot sticks and their shields and... But anyway, the governor's come in, Andy Gallagher. Right, let's talk this over. And uh, it come down one at a time because I'm not prepared to stand and talk to you. But nobody threw nothing at this cunt. Because this cunt, he, he, he had a... There was something about Andy Gallagher, he called him square go gal. When, when he said something, he meant it, you know, he had a wee bit of respect. Mm -hmm. Hold your fire, he shouted. It's Andy Gallagher. So he walked in, bold as fucking brass. You know what I mean? He's chief. He's like to the screws. who were at the big double doors with the wee, wee latch. He's like, you just get to fuck. Don't you any use cunts come in here? Yeah? Well, he spoke to him. So anyway, I'm up there. I've got fucking, I'm up, I've got some cunts fucking wee hat, D mob hat, all, all Sonny Leach. I get <laughs> right, escape from soccer. I'm going to introduce you to him. Sonny Leach. Mm -hmm. They called him a Sockton Harrier. So I've got I've got Sonny's fucking hat. He's shouting at the cell, wanting me a bastard, Johnny boy. That's my hat, you boy. <laughs> fucking don't lose that. That's my deep, my deep mob hat. So anyway, the governor's that. Like, right, you might come down, we'll talk to you one at a time. So we're all in each other. So where are we going to be talking? We'll take you into my hardly room, which is in the punishment block. And there's no fucking skylight in his order room. We put a toilet pan right through it, and as long as you don't tap his big desk, she come in here and talk. And um, so we does that. One at a time, I'm not being done. And uh, he said, that's when he was telling me about the changes. He said, so what you want to do? He says, uh, are you going to stay up there? Are you might go back up with your pals. Or he said, you might go up and discuss it. Or do you want me to take you out and I can take you out to the surgery and, and put you in a cell there? Because that's where you're all going anyway, because if it's all about was wrecked. Mm. And I went, you know what? I need to go and talk to the rest. Enjoy his word. Give me his word. He's right on you go. And let me climb back up the rope and into the into the, into the attic where all the troops were so what was happening I said mate hey, we're doing one at a time to tell us kind of about the condition that's what we're all fighting against here and sure as fuck to his word each one he's been done there to speak to the governor was allowed to climb back up into the attic again where we could all have a conflave or sitting on the fucking sitting on the fire the bonfire we up there eating the toast and beans and fucking big dixies of soup and fucking loving like kings <laughs> <laughs> I'm conscious anyway I've done back <laughs> so anyway we all, we all decided we are going to come down, eh? But Andy Gallic ended up there. He ended up with a terrible reputation and ended up with a more fearsome reputation. Because after a riot, uh, we were all put back into the punishment block. We were re rapidly. Rapid. Rapidly they re it. Because that, that was a fucking... That was a fear, you know what I mean? Oh, just step out of line. You're gang and bend the hoose. That's what they called it, the screws. Gang and bend the hoose, you'll be ganging. And uh, so anyway... Andy Gallagher was doing his rounds one day and a wee pal of mine, a guy called Bobby Brody. Bobby was doing a life sentence. Bobby shouting down the archive at Ventilum system because that was the way he used to communicate if he mm. didn't have any broken windies in the, in the punishment block. He said he was going to slash the governor on his rounds. And I said, where are you going? you go, fucking quite right. <laughs> so hey, the governor, when I hear the screams, I can hear the screams from myself and I'm fucking hell. And I hear them, what the fuck? So I'm banging in. Every country's kicking our doors with a fucking arsehole. That's all you can do, you can't you? Don't, you know what's going on. You, you, know, you know some kind of letter, you know, you can do shout and make threats and mm -hmm. wait till we get here, you yeah, fucker. We'll wreck your fucking place, wipe your families. Oh, fucking the madness, you know. So anyway, next time I'll be spy hole, you know, I'm looking through. And the Bobby Brody, he said to me, it's all right, young, you can't do nothing, it's kosher. And I can see a fucking big rat in his face. And I'm what the fuck happened? It turns out that he tried to slash the governor, Andy Gallagher. Andy Gallagher's ex sass, so Andy's on the ball, you know what I mean? He's an ex sass. Andy Gallagher's took a scalpel off him and fucking slashed him. Slashed him, yeah. Stuck it in his fucking face oh. and started prodding him. But he didn't even know that the scalpel was stuck in, in Bobby Brody's face, huh? Fuck so, sake. 
when you think back and, you, and you'll see all the banners that was up, Slasher Gallagher and Millennium or mm -hmm. well, that's, that's what I'm mm -hmm. referring to, yeah. So anyway, there was a time later on when Andy, Andy Gallagher moved on and, and I felt quite bad about this because he was good to me and he, and he saved me for getting a few fucking down this guy, you know what I mean? And he, and he, and he, and he really didn't, I mean that, you know. And um, so anyway, he moved on and he became the number one governor in Balleny Prison, which is the number one head governor in the whole of Scotland. And um, so anyway, I'm still fighting the fucking screws. I'm still fucking, I'm breaking out the pens. I'm climbing out all these pens that they think can't be climbed out with the screws on the catwalk, on the roof and doing more damage and the usual fucking madness and fighting the screws. And so anyway, it's charged me, done me five assaults on the screws, battered three of them with these sweats and fucking fighting between them in the toilet using the ball cock and the fucking, when we had the ball cock in the system. So I mean, I mean, fuck it, man. I said, I'm going to go, fucking not guilty. Governor's like, what about your witnesses? And the new governor, Alfie Smith, I went, defending my fucking self. Fuck you. I mean, you ain't fucking, don't you worry about me. You're a witness. You'll be getting fucking cited. Not me, I'll not be going. I said, you'll be fucking going. I said, you know, see that, but that ain't fucking tough guy. I was back up to court a couple of days later. And I say to the judge, defending myself, the lawyers lied to me. But I'm free. I said, you get to fuck. I remember you for the fucking right page standing out there before your flunky fucking try to convince us to come down your country on the right. You get to fuck. I'm doing my own thing here. So I defended myself. So the judge is lied to me. It's for the jury, and you know, he's like, right, listen, you got a, you got a you're a chance of getting your solicitor here to back you up here and Dave, because a lot of work involved here. I remember, fuck. I want my witnesses. I want Alfie Smith, who was the Peter Heath governor. I want Chief Murison, who was the Chief Peter Heath. I want fucking Andy Gallagher. Slasher Gallagher, he was in Berlin. And Berlin, he said, so I just say, right, okay, when are you going to recess? I said, go to court back up again. He said, what do you want Andy Gallagher for? I said, that bastard slashed my, <laughs> that bastard slashed my pal. I said, no, I need him in here to prove to be unreasonable doubt to the jury. That it's not just the prisoners that is violent, the capable of using violence, and the fucking all liars. I say, this cunt slashed my pal and the guys in the special unit and who. I've reported the matter to the police. The police, which they did, I did, I did, I did, I did sent the cop or Reported the matter to the police, and uh, the police are now investigating the matter. I've told them exactly what happened, and I'm waiting word back. But I want Andy Gallagher here as a witness. I want Alfie Smith here as a witness. They are condoning the conditions, the extreme conditions in this prison which is enough to make the same this guy go fucking mad. And so therefore, it's no all one-sided, and there's a lot of, there should be a lot of really on my part here, because I'm fucking under duress here, severe duress. I can't even go and pick a decent lawyer, because the fucking lawyer's out drinking with the fucking governor. Mm -hmm. And he's out there with the sick of state and the governor, and the lawyer, and the sick of state, they're all fucking sitting drinking whiskey in the office. Yeah, fucking wanker, that's me, get on, you get yourself to fuck, the judge is like me, oh, I'm not swearing in this court. You know, you could never apologise, eh? So anyway, that's exactly what I've done. I went and defended myself, and uh, and, I, and I got out of, out of three of the charges. I got away with three not guilties on, and uh, I, I, got, uh, I found guilty for fighting with the screws in the, in the toilets and using the ball, ball cock when it was there for clubbing them. Well, you know, I get fucking clubbed on country with their truncheon, you know. Where did you get added on your sentence? Then it was three months I got added on that, yeah. But what happened to the one in Sort Sorton then, Johnny? Was it Joe then? Got Joseph, 25 year? No, Joseph uh, Joseph got a life sentence. He got a life sentence um when I was on the dirty protest in Peter Heed, just after me and my brother Jim escaped from money. And uh, somebody shouted for the cell block, somebody shouted for the hall. Johnny boy, did you hear we heard the news? We've not got any fucking radios or nothing down there. We're, we're fucking we're living like modern day cavemen. I said, no, what's going on? He said, well, was it Ice Cream Wars was on at that time and uh, there was a full family, the Doyle family were wiped out in, in a flat in Cranhill, yeah. Somebody lit a fire in a, in a cupboard um, in, a, in, a, in a stairwell and the, in a, in the fucking smoke wiped mm -hmm. the poor family out, yeah. So anyway, I get, I get feedback for the, for the whole, somebody shouting down to me. Um, Joseph's fucking Joseph been arrested for the murders and I thought, never man, okay, never, never, never. So Jim took up the doors of line for me. Yeah, so we are demented at this, as you can imagine, at this mm. particular time in the fucking place in an uproar, the cell blocks out of your commission, the screws in the hall, can't you get any more prisoners into the cell block because this time there's nothing. There's no, they can't put us anywhere else. Mm. We've no one of these, no bed, no fucking clays, 
nae toilets, nae piss pots. So anybody who was who stepped out of line in the main halls, they couldn't put them into the punishment box, so they had to do their punishment in their own cell. You know, like a bed down sort of thing, eh? So anyway, then the apps, when Joe got done for that, and my mama came out to visit me and Jim, you know, Jim, Jim and the older brothers said to my ma, oh, ma, listen, it'll be fine when he goes to the court. And I'll tell you, ma, you'll get out. And I was like, he's fucking tall out of shite, Jim. She was going, how the fuck we got here? It's the fucking biggest man's murder in fucking modern times, Jim. Jack, he's going to, the coppers are going to let him go to court and let him walk away. It's not going to happen. I see he's fucking going to get a jail here, man. It's going to take years for him to go and, and murder you, mate. And, and it couldn't have sounded right come from me, because I'm not meant to know these kind of things. I'm mm -hmm. the guy with the fucked up weed. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, mother, you're going to need to be prepared for this. You get your wee fucking coat armour on, mother, and fucking get prepared. There's going to be some fight to get him out of this. And we're not in a position to fucking do anything. We're lying in the jail. My dad's dead. Mm -hmm. Fucking some fight you've got in your hands, kid. You know what I mean? And it turned out, yeah, he got the life sentence. Eh? But Jim and I escaped people, didn't he? Jim was in, we escaped in 1980, June 1980, Sunday. Um, I think it might have been the 2nd of June, Sunday. We were in Berlini. We came down for Berlini for visits to go and visit my mother. And um, the screws in Berlini didn't want us there because we'd already, we'd already rioted up in Peter Heed and so we had quite a fearsome reputation as, as, as a wee motley right, mot mot crew when you take any shit, you know. So we goes to Berlini. Andy Gallagher's now the Heat Governor in Berlini. Did he like at this point? Aye, aye, he kind of liked it, but he, I'll tell you the story. Mm -hmm. I felt embarrassed, but I'll tell you the story. And um, so we're doing that, and the screws are threatened to go in a work to rule. This is just like a strike, the foot, you know, the foot. But they still have to come into prison, you know. And the work to rule means that goes slow. They don't need to open everybody up for the dining hall at the one time or the works. For them, it's on a go, go, slow, I mean, slow pace, you know what I mean? So they go on, we call it a work to rule, and it's a go slow. So we hear they want us out of jail. But before I'd left for Peter Heed, after the riot, they split me and Jim and my pal Archie up. So they've got me in, uh, they've got me in uh, A hall and Jim and Archie moved to B hall, which is a lesser secure hall. Eh? So I'm no sooner in myself and I'm sawing the bars and my, and my Peter. And um, we've been told that in a matter of weeks, if, if I can show a willing to fucking, to, to be, kind of behave myself, Jim and Archie will be allowed to come back to, to the same hall as me. And that, that suited us fine, because that meant then we could all escape for, the, for Marcel one day. Yeah, Mike Pierheed. So anyway, I've done the bars, and the bars are flat bars, and they lie at a 45 degree angle. They're probably about 3 to 4 inches um, wide. And they're, they're painted a certain yellow. They're painted a yellow that, you know, you, if, you, if, you're into, if you're an artist and you're in Peter Heed, you couldn't buy this yellow paint. You had to make your own yellow up because it was quite an outstanding paint so that nobody could paint their bars and, mm -hmm. and, and nobody could cut their bars and paint over. So anyways, I'm sawing the bars. I'm not hanging about. Fuck this, carry on, man. I'm just not hanging about here, man. So I don't know, I went like to gym, I said, that's me doing the bars. So what I had to do was, you don't cut the bar straight through. Because the bar plays a tune. This is how it works, right? When the screws come into your cell, they take their truncheon out and they hit each bar. So the top bar will go dink, the second bar will go dink, the next bar will go dink, and if it's one of the bars being cut, they'll go dunk. Ah, uh, so they know. So they know that tune, so the trick is, is to leave. Leave it on, to leave it, leave a bit on each side of the bar so that it plays the same tune. So, anyways, I'm like a gym that I say, right, go and see the governor. The bars are done. We're just ready to fucking go. So I've got them all filled in me, 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 um, some sort of blue tack thing. It wasn't a blue tack back in the day, but some sort of putty and painted them over. And um, so I'm ready. So I, I'm thinking they're coming to move in with me, so they go and see the governor. And the governor says, right, you two are going for visits to Berlin next week. Why don't you wait till he's come back for visits and then you can move in with Johnny? Because Jim was getting put into my cell 
And Archie, my pal, he was getting put into the cell next door, which was called an iron lung. So we'd already grafted the wall in the iron lung and we had it fought in with paper mache. So that when Archie got put into that wall, into that cell, he could come through our wall and we and Jim were already in there and we could take the bars off. And of course we'd make, make, make for escape. So anyways, I'm looking devastated. I don't know they're going for visits. I'm like, never man, no way. I ain't hanging about here for another week, Jim. Fucking way, man. I can't do that. It's nerve-wracking. You just don't know if somebody's going to come in and go, ding, ding, don't, or that's going to fall out. You know what I mean? I went, no way, man, never. I can't do it, man. So I went, fuck that. I said, I'm coming down with ease. So I went to see the governor. And I went, listen, the brothers going down for, oh, no, 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 you can't go. You never saved any visits up and you've got your right to the Secretary of State for permission. I mean, you know what? Fuck you in the Secretary of State. Fuck a lot of if I don't get done for visits, my mother, I'll just write your fucking jail. Are you going to punishment? I said, I'll just write your fucking punishment. Well, it doesn't matter the fuck to me. So that's big screw, big PO says to me, let me talk to you outside, Johnny. Keep calm. Just keep calm, he said to me. And you promised me if I can get you done for visits, you're not going to cause any trouble. Right down there. I said, I'm a fuck. I just want you done. Listen, if Jim's going away down to Peter Heath to see the family, coming for Peter Heath to Berlin to see the family, and the family's still going to have to come away up here to see me, so why not let me down? And the family can see the two of together. Makes fucking more sense. You just try to fucking annoy people. Anyway. And that's exactly what happened, right? We'll let you down. No trouble. Don't you go in that roof, he says to me. I say, oh, you're fine. So anyway, we're down there. And um, a big fella from Black Hill comes down, big guy called Tony Dallamore. Tony's a, Tony a trustee and Peter Heath Prison, which means he's, he can walk about the place where the works with the screws. He can um, he can go and, and build walls and he, he can, he's got a, a full run of the jail, but he's way he's way the, the, the boulders, the screws, you know. So anyway, it turns out that big Tony Tony came down to Berlini and I by passing one oh well, passing each other going to the worksheds or the dining hall. And he's outstanding, Mike Tony. He's about six feet five with pure red hair, you know. He's like, Johnny boy, I need to talk to you, man. I need to speak to you. Go to the record night. And my heart sank. I went, never, man. Fucking never. I knew. I felt it. I went, there. Fucking no way, man. I said, you can't have found my bars. <laughs> so Jim was like, just calm down, you know, no. So Big Tony, I meet some that, that evening. He's like, don't go back up the road, wee man, he says to me. I went, never, Tony. He went, don't run it, Johnny, they're waiting on you. He says, I've heard the bastards talking. They found your bars and they went to the governor. And the governor, Berlini's on the phone to the governor saying, get down here and get these cunts back. My staff are fucking no having this. They, they want him to fuck out of his jail. So the governor and um, the governor at Peter Heed, who was George, sorry, the governor at Peter Heed at that particular time took over Andy Gallagher with a guy called George Dingo. So we, George, he's reassuring the governor and the staff in Berlin, not at all. These fuckers think they're escaping from here. They think they're pulling the wool over our eyes. That bastard saw these bars. The brother thinks he's getting moved in with him. The steam fella thinks he's gone next door where already grafted through the wall. So just keep quiet. Let's let everybody slide. They think they're coming back up here and they're going to escape. So anyway, that satisfied the screws down in Berlin. It satisfied them that well, thank fuck for that. They've started the bar, so they know there's going to be an escape, but they're, they, they're now being reassured that the escape's taking place in Peter Heath. So anyways, and I'm, they don't know I'm aware of this information. Yeah, and I'm like, never, Jim, I said, we need to get the fuck out here, mate. I was feared they were, going to, they were going to come and take me, but it turns out that I find out later, the only reason they never took you away to Peter Heath, Johnny, is because that had left Jim and Archie, and they were terrified that they'd have caused a riot in Malini and, and kicked off. So they went, okay, just keep quiet. They don't need to know we're onto them. Yeah. So I was like, nice one, Tony, cheers. So I say that was the, I don't know, I say that was the Thursday or something, or the Wednesday that Tony, Tony had uh, told me this. And I was so fucking desperate. I went, I need to get out here and work an ASAP, man. And so I find a way, I see the, I find a way out for, for Berlini, for, for B-Hall and Berlini, tap flat, and up, up visiting a pal. In the tap flat, I'm not meant to be on the tap flat because I'm a security, but I've slept on. And Jim's not meant to be in the tap flat. You're not meant to be in the tap flat or the bottom flat. You've got to be either in the second flat or the third flat because you're a security prisoner. So, I mean, pal says to me, Look on here, Johnny, get up. 
So anyway, I've got in, into the shower, into the shower room, and you have at the end of millennia, which was put up in the seventies. And we opened this door that, that the screws are allowed into to regulate the water hot and cold for the two showers that's there on each landing. So I looked up and I see this this grill, this steel, thick, heavy metal steel grill, great, with this big brass padlock on it, this fucking serious looking pass padlock, you know. So I was like to the guys, Pallio's by Gallic, I like how it, and another fella, they were past me at the time. I said, Jake, you, you, you get that padlock off, and they I'll fucking get it off, all right. So they, they spent a couple of days sawing this, and they couldn't get that, they, they fucking, they stripped the inside of this padlock, or the works and they could, cause they kept going skating, they couldn't get it on, so they ended up, they cut one of the bars. So anyway, we know the bars bent back on Saturday night, we know the bar's done, bent right fucking back. No, that's it for a squeaky one that they're going over. So it's a lock up at five o'clock Saturday and Sunday, you know, for the, for the rest of the, the next morning. So anyways, on the Saturday, the screws got a fright because they heard something was going to go down. So now we opened the, opened the door at seven o'clock for the cocoa shift to give you a cup of tea. I said, you know, the screws were looking right here. I said, oh, never mind, fucking tagged this. Tippled, I thought they'd tippled to the, to the bars that had been cut. In the, in the tap flat in the shower room, which took you onto the ad, took you onto the flat roof of Bellini. And I thought, never, man, never, never fucking gutty, you know, gutty, you know what I mean? I thought, never. Anyway, we pal with mine, that guy called Alec Fulton, he's he's next cell to me, and they've got pipes running through the cell walls in Bellini, and some got wee gaps in them, and you can sit down there and you can communicate with each other. He's like, something's going down, Johnny. He said, you see the country, there's some mountain of man. I said, oh, fuck it. So he knows that I'm having a dash mm -hmm. in the morning. And I went, never mind, it's all over, mate. And I saw, I'm, and I had a couple of photographs of my family, so I put them through the pipe in a newspaper. Opened it, put, passed them through, in case I went, right, I said, look, you have to photos for me. Anyway, all oh, quiet, man. Sunday morning, screws open the door, and it just haven't seemed to be normal. Slop out. And they bought her. Oh, so anyway, we tic tac each other, me and Jim. I'm on the second flat. Jim's on the second flat, and Archie's on the third flat. So we clocked each other, and all, all seems to be well. So, anyways, if, um, I can't get to the tap flat because Jim's already asked to screw on our landing if he can go up just to, to swap a book with another guy. And probably because of Jim's reputation, man, the hell's the screw was fucking probably fair to say no when you go. But Archie's made his way to the tap flat. So I need, to make, I need to make my way to the fucking bottom flat to take the fucking, so it didn't look suspicious. And um, I get in, into the shower in the bottom flat and the, the, and the same door applies. You know, there's two showers that's there. Um, in this thick door, for, um, this wooden door for to regulate the water. But then, that's as far as you can go. But uh, at the side, at the side, the right hand side of the door, there's a shaft that goes for the bottom flat right up to the very top hole. You know, so if you were up the top flat, we could talk to each other through this through this ventilator shaft. This shaft, you know, it was, and inside this shaft was pipes and fucking pipes, mere pipes, huh? So anyway, I get in, I bang in, shut the door over, and I'm climbing. I'm climbing like a fucking rat. Like I can't even move. You know, you're talking about a gap like that, James. You know, maybe fucking, maybe a feet, mm -hmm. if it was that. And me being the wee skinny wide, you can't know what my right up. You know, I can hear all the shivers. If I'm going past each landing, I can hear the guys talking about <laughs> the evolution. You know what I mean? So I make my, my way to the tap, and Jim and Archie's already in there. I'm like, yes, man. So anyway, me being the skinniest, they've punted me up through the big steel grill, a stick steel grill. So once I'm on the steel grill, I've got a, a wooden door to contend to, yeah, flat door and roof. So I put my back against it and fucking go to this thing, oh, oh yeah, man. I had a glorious day for Glasgow, man. Mm -hmm. Sunshine. I don't think I'd ever been that high a point in Glasgow as I've ever been when I was on that bit of that roof here. Fucking this whole city was basking, you know, we're talking, <laughs> we're talking 8 o'clock in the morning, you're afraid of me. Fucking even, not even out yet, <laughs> And even the matter of fuck whether get caught or not, could I direct the place anyway? <laughs> so anyway, we're out there. We're, we're on this flat bit of roof, which is adjacent to the big halls or the big massive chimneys. 
And we're like, never man, fucking, you, you can't, you're scared to look here, because the screws are down below, they're all going to work, we can see them coming out their clothes, <laughs> and they're like, and I went, never fucking hell, so we're like, keep doing, I said, fuck can we keep doing, because we're waiting, and we're waiting on the crew coming with the motor and the rope, because mm-hmm. we've got a reel of tape that we've stole for, for the textile shop, uh, in Malini, you know, it's for tagging mattresses or something, so it's a big reel of tape, and it's probably about fucking 90 feet, so we've got that base, and we've got a bolt put through the middle of it, we are not, to get a bit of weight. So anyway, Jim and Archie, they're talking down and I'm like, fuck this, I'm still there like a pirate, I couldn't get a fuck. <laughs> I'm still there like a pirate, looking, looking for ships. They're like, fucking hell, Johnny, get down. I said, don't fuck off, ever hiding down, we can't even see them. They're never going to fucking see us and we might think we're not even made it. Mm-hmm. Fuck off, man. So anyway, they're like, well, we're going back down. I said, I need fucking go, I'm just right to the place. Oh, no, I don't throw all this again. I said, I ain't fucking going down. So they're ready to go back down into their cells to, to, to get to fuck, because they think they're not turning up in the motor. Mm-hmm. So I'm standing there like a wee pirate, man, looking out <laughs> to sea. Oh, and, I, and I seen the black motor coming round them all night. I was like, here they're coming, man. So then we come back, they've come back out, and we've got the reel of tape. They've just boldly walked out of the car, three and walk, boldly walked out of the car, screws up, we can see the screws walking in the distance, coming out of there. And don't forget, their flats are right across with us, mm-hmm. and the screws girdens right down below, you know, fucking 90 feet down below. So we're on the on, on the roof, so we've got the we've got the reel of tape, tossed it air the wall. And there's a camel just fucking a feet below us. We've tossed it for the top of the roof, right over and above the camera, right down there the wall, and into the screws garden. So they've tied them out in rear rope, right, onto the onto onto the reel of tape. And we've pulled them out in rear rope up, tied it to the top of the roof. They've tied it and ended them out in rear rope to the screws washing line. So we have still clean it up the fucking wall. <laughs> Yeah, he's blowing them away. <laughs> oh, God, oh, fucking the cans was all oh, police leave. And I'm like, fucking dangerous maniacs on the run. <laughs> fucking all oh, police leave, cancelled. And oh, let you find these cunts. Uh, Many he's escaped. Three years, aye. Is that oh. the first time anybody's ever escaped from Berlin? Ah, I don't know. Somebody said that to me, but I couldn't imagine that. Uh. And that was just, bit, that's no, you're trying to escape with Peter Heath, just yeah. escaped for Berlin. Eh? What happened with, with Joel when he escaped him for Sockton? And he well, did well, he glue himself to Buckingham Palace fence when, when, protest? When, when, when we, when Joseph got done for the life sentence, uh, I was still in the jail, bear mind, 1982, 83. I still had a long way to go in my prison sentence, and I thought, fucking hell, Joseph, I was, I was doing Berlin visit him, I seen him. And I thought, fuck, I came for the cages, didn't he, Berlin? I was going down for a trial. One of my pals was fighting the screws and I was just sighted a witness for the day out, you know what I mean? <laughs> and um, Andy Gallagher there, Slasher Gallagher, and he's like, man, how you doing? I went, I know bad. He's by the way, he said, uh, yeah, the police were up my door. Yeah, he fucking nice one, he says to me. I could have stuck him in for the slashing the movie protein. and I fucking felt embarrassed, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, oh, don't worry about Andy, you're still here. <laughs> you, you never get done, you but I need fucking thanks to you. He said, yeah, fuck's <laughs> fucking going to run the... Run about the court, shout my name, fucking ass slash this. He said, you know the score, he says, some country tries to slash you, you slash them back. And he was right, you know what I mean? The fucking guy was right, but it was quite kind of embarrassing. So anyway, I, was, I got a visit with Joseph, and uh, Andy Gallagher says, well, me came for the cages for one day, and Andy Gallagher says to me, I'm only went to Bainbury for the trial and back up road the next day, Gallagher says to me, eh, does your mother know you're down here? And I went, no, I said, I'm up in the fucking cage, I'm only down here for a witness from Mark Louie. He said, well, I guarantee you, he said, um, if, your, if your mother comes down for, the, down for a visit at night, she'll get in to see you. And sure as fuck, fucking screws that, he's got a visit still. But he must have phoned, phoned or got somebody to phone the house and say, come down, go and get a visit with your boy, you know. So I did have a lot of respect for Andy Gallagher, and I felt fucking embarrassed for good asking him, but, you know, just fucked up in the fucking head, you know what I mean? So anyway, I got a talk with Joseph. And Joseph, Joseph was even younger than me in the head. And Joseph fucking, Joseph was just, I don't know, I never knew Joseph, but he, he wasn't like us, you know what I mean? And I knew, I knew, I knew he needed a lot of help to fucking, to fight this fucking case, you know what I mean? I thought, never Joe man, he's fucking one of the biggest fight of our lives, mate, you know? And fucking need to put him on hold, man, to fucking, get that fucking fight that hard to stop escape, I can't do it. I fucking can't stop writing, and it's fucking, <laughs> it's gonna, gonna kill her mother eventually, you know what I mean? Right. And, um... I, could, I, I met Joseph down there and he slipped me a he slipped me a, a, a Gillette razor blade. The old Gillette razor blades, the old steel, mm-hmm. tungsten steel ones in. Eh? I said, get me a couple of blades, Joe. 
I said, uh, I saw my scarf, I was up in the cages and I was going back and I was going to cut the bars eh? And um, it wouldn't really matter if I wouldn't be able to escape or not, out of curiosity. Because when you're in your cage, there's a mirror outside your, your cage, and mirror's that size, eh? say, about, say about 12, 12, 12 by 12, 10 by 12. And I often thought there was a fucking camera behind that, you know. Yeah, you because know, there was no purpose in the mirror being there. Cause you weren't allowed a, a bar of soap in your cage. You weren't allowed a fucking toothbrush. You weren't allowed a comb. You know, I mean, the fuck's going on here, man? I thought they were spying on us, you know. You know these hidden, hidden mirrors, the cameras. Anyway, Joe gets me gets me a couple of jelly plays, and I went, oh, that'll do me, fuck it. So I wrapped them and wrapped them and fucking and packed them up my backside there. Uh, they all wrapped up in the wee tube. So I get up to, back up to the cages. The thing is with the old Gillette razor blades, is they're made of tungsten steel, and tungsten steel back in the day was, was probably probably the hardest steel you could get. Mm -hmm. So, and of course the bars, the bars are an inch in diameter up there on your cage, yeah. So I, I managed to get a, I managed to use the tap of my, my, my Gillette steel um, handle to unscrew a brass screw nail in the back of the toilet door and, and the cages. So this big brass fucking screw nail about two inches. So when I get back to the cage when the time was right, I had a steel table in the cage, so I, I would put the, the razor blade I'd put the I put the Gillette razor blade on the very edge of the of the steel table and would strike it repeatedly with the with the brass screw nail so that it would become serrated. And I would turn the blade over and do the exact same thing, so that the, the, the actual razor blade would look like a, a hacksaw blade, with a you know the, with a serrated like wee teeth. And that's how we used the. That's how I managed to saw through the bars up in the up in the cages and number this. And I eventually got through, but we got caught before we could get through the wall. But I managed to get that mirror off, mm -hmm. and we fuck all behind that. <laughs> but it was all psychological. How did you learn all that? All the oh, knives and is that just sorry, people tricks. in the jail or did you read no, it? No, no, what is it? Oh, it comes to me. It comes to me. No, it is. It's no. People think you're, you're people go, oh, that fucking, you're a genius at escaping. It's no. But you must be, it's man, because you've escaped from every fucking jail in Scotland. It, it, it's fear. It's a lot, it's a lot of day with fear and yeah. fucking paranoia and being locked up and claustrophobic. You're claustrophobic, I was just about to say yeah, that. Yeah, well, but you couldn't tell anything, couldn't you? You were claustrophobic. They took you to the nut house, James. Aye. Yeah, there was no, there was no checks and balances, mate. How did you get on Because I know you were doing a documentary with Ross Kemp. Yeah, well, funny. How did that go? I was talking to Ross about, um, I went in there for, uh, for one particular reason. Ross wanted to know about the escape, which was classed as Scotland's great escape at the time. Uh. Um, they're calling us the Bellini Tardons or, or SAS style escape, you know. So I was in there talking to Ross and um, I was right outside, funny enough, strangely enough, I was right outside the whole bee hole looking up to the very spot but I'd absolutely clean off, you know, and Ross was saying, fucking hell, Johnny, you know fear? I said, nah, but you're desperate, you don't know fear, Ross. Yeah. I mean, you fucking don't know fear, mate. I said, only because it was fear, it was them behind, the ones that were left behind, the guards, because that, that escape caused, caused a hell of a hollow blue, and, uh, and and as much as there was screws uh, demoted, there was a, a serious, serious crime squad investigation into it. Um, apparent brave's been taken with, 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 with certain screws in there and was that well you know all, all I can say to you this James have you ever heard that any prisoners been granted immunity from a prison after escaping by the Secretary of State of Scotland uh -huh. yeah we were granted immunity yeah me Archie and Jim because the coppers wanted the, us to give a statement as to who took the bribe mm -hmm. yeah and when we get caught, you know, they kept me myself first in uh, Stuart Street in Glasgow. The three of brought on the same same time. And they say, right, Johnny, we don't give a fuck about the escape. We don't give a fuck for Lana. My poor sister, she got a year for harbouring me. We don't care for Lana. We don't care for you or any cunt. We want the bastards that took the bribe. And I say, well, you know what? I'm, I'm not in a position to give you a statement. I'll get fucking strung up and I'll go back to Berlin. And they went, We'll make sure you don't get strung up. Man, how the fuck are you going to make sure that? He said, we've got a trick. We've got a plan. He says, right, if we go and get Jim and Archie and bring them up, we talk about it. And I mean, yeah, okay. So anyway, they goes down wherever they went, down the cell below in Stuart Street, police station, and the uh, serious crimes board brought Jim and Archie up. And we were all shaking hands with each other and fucking hugging each other. So I'm like, I says, here, 
these cunts are fucking demented to you. I'm winking, can I don't know where places? Bugs. Bugs, you know what I mean? I said, they've been asking me to give the, give the, give, give the name of Big Bootsy, I stuck them in. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, ask, they're asking me to give the name of Bootsy. <laughs> and I went, oh, I'm saying fuck off. So, 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 so they went like that, right, okay, don't say fuck off. <laughs> Cause, so we decided to call the screws up, yeah. So they come up and they come up with a packet of cigarettes and a lighter. And we were all sitting in the cell, you know. And um, yeah, they're talking about what, what could possibly happen to us because we're going back to Bellini, right? And we're going to court the next day for the escape. How long was you on the run for? Three weeks. We're going to court the next day for the escape. So the lawyers came into my cell and said, I'm here to arrest you, you fucking represent me, you selfie fuck, I'm completely not guilty. Fuck off. He's like, you're pleading not guilty. The fucking whole country knows you escaped, Johnny. I said, I don't give a fuck. The whole country's telling lies. I'm no having a lawyer. I'm pleading not guilty. And that's exactly what we've done. Eh? But anyway, after the court case, the coppers come in and say, right, guys, we're taking you to Bellini. Somebody, somebody wants to meet you there. So no, it's probably about, I don't know, six o'clock, seven o'clock. We get, um, we get an unusual escort straight into Bellini Prison in the back of, a, back of a serious crime squad vehicle. They were all tooled up, you know, the guns they caught with a serious crime squad. Takes us into the reception. When the screws are in the reception, they're waiting there and they're fucking raging. You can see them, they're livid. They want to kill us, you know what I mean? They fucking, the staff, some of their staff have been demoted. Did they kick fuck out you back then? No, oh, uh, I, but I know they know the end. They would have, if the coppers wouldn't have been there, they don't know if they would have made a comeback, you know what I mean? We wouldn't have taken any shit. But they did give terrible doings right back then. Yes, James, they did, aye. So anyway, the, the, the publicity of this fucking escape carried was fucking tremendous. It was, it was fucking, it was all in our favour. It was fucking, everybody was loving it, you know what I mean? But, anyway, but, but the, the, the bride part was not getting into it well with the turnkey either. <laughs> so we drive into the reception, we got signs over it in my deal gear. It takes us into this building, just across from the B-Hall and A-Hall where we escaped from. And I see the screws all surrounding and it's around the building and the turnkeys and I said, what the fuck did happen here, man? I thought we were getting done in. Oh, you fucking off the numbers here, man. I thought we were getting set off, I thought we were going to get whacked. Yeah, so anyway, he gets out and he's like, in he's come. But the, the, the turnkeys outside that surrounded the building weren't they allowed in the building. So we're, we're in this room, James, and there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a table and chair there, a large table with two chairs on one side and three chairs on the other side, the other side. So we take a seat, and they were hanging about five, ten minutes, and then walks this chap, a beautiful big dolly bird, who turns out to be his secretary, and he turns out to be Skeen. He was one of the main procurators in Glasgow. He was the man that stamped all the indictments, officially stamped an indictment to go ahead. So he says, listen, guys, uh, we said, what do you want? And he says, listen, fellas, he says, um... I believe there's something you want to tell us. And she said, fucking told you that. He went, them. You know, so we were sitting there and we were, all, we were on the ball, you know what I mean? And I was like, listen, I fucking can't tell you what you want to know. I said, get killed, dead the night, when you fucking make it through the night, mate. He said, listen to me, he says, you will be safe. He says, when you leave here, and you go back to your hall, when you're all going back to A hall, E hall, sorry, and uh, you'll be in, a cell next to each other, one, two, three cells right adjacent to each other. They've took the locks off and put on special locks. There's special guards outside your door that nobody else can get access to except for the guy with the key. And if anybody dares attempt to get anywhere near you, they'll be going to the fucking jail as well. So what I'm saying to you is, you have been granted immunity by the Secretary of State for Scotland and you can go back to any secure jail that you so wish. But give the statement after you. <laughs> yeah. So he says, well, listen, fellas, we fuck, we're not in a position to give the statement in our era. And he says, well, why is that? And I went, well, because you've got T.C. Campbell's, and he's lying in the untried for, for, for jail breaking us. And you've got Shada Lafferty. I said, two relatives, T.C. Shad, TC and Shada, two relatives of yours. You've got them lying in the untried in Berlin right now for, for the jail break for aiding the bet us in the, in the, in the break. And uh, they had nothing to do with it, of course. I mean, they had nothing to do with the jailbreak. <laughs> and uh, so why why should we use the statement you are going to fucking fit them up and verbal them up to, 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 gain a, to gain a conviction? They all lark. 
no, 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 we don't work that way. He says, well, it's us you're talking to, mate. Fuck's sake, we've been brought up with you. We know how you work. You fucking fitted my dad up with explosives for like five years. So we know how it all works with, with coppers fitting, fitting people up. It's policy. So anyway, so they weren't too happy. But we said, well, we'll give you the statement, once TC and Tommy Campbell, once TC and Shada go to trial. And bear in mind, we're witnesses at a trial. And he's like, right, mm -hmm, okay then. You, you mean that? Yeah, of course. We're still granted we're, we're, we're immunity. <laughs> He went, yeah, he's still granted immunity. He's about here in a day or two. So anyway, true to the word, I marched right here, this fucking serious crime squad. I unprecedented right into the hall. They were standing there, and they were chilled up. They you know, they weren't hiding nothing. And uh, Davy Walker, uh, Norrie, Norrie Walker and Davy threw two top men and got his police force. And their wee crew, and they chilled up. No, so I don't think they were just fucking there to intimidate us. I think they were letting the fucking crew behind the, the screws know. Mm -hmm. The most powerful fucking gang in the fucking country next to the cop was the POA. I think they were letting them know, here, yeah, don't try any fucking nonsense with us. But anyways, they put us into ourselves, cop was come here and shook our hands, congratulated us on the escape, and we were all shite, you know. But I still think he's a crazy going to court and plead not guilty, because we denied that the court mm -hmm. pled not guilty, the fucking judge was fucking, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> And the judge's like, hey, proof that you never escaped. I've got 150 fucking witnesses uh, to say that I never escaped for any jail, mate. <laughs> just. I guess I just, just, fucking, just putting the track, putting the system on trial, yeah. Jim, you know. Anyways, Andy Gallagher comes on the next day. No, what happened was before Jim got caught on the Saturday, I might tell the story. Jim got caught on the Saturday. And I get a phone call saying, Have you seen the news? They've got Jim. And I thought, Never, man. Fucking brother's going to get killed with these cunts. We take him back to Bolinie. So me and Archie makes for a while. There was no, there was no mobile phones in the days. We makes for a while, don't you? Phone box and we phones Bellini. This is on the Saturday. Jim, Jim was caught on the Saturday. We phones Bellini on the Saturday. I asked to speak to the governor, and whoever answered the phone says, hey, "Governor's not here. I'm talking to you." I say, "You're talking to Johnny Boy, Johnny Boy Steele," and uh, and Archie shouted into the mouthpiece, "And Archie, fucking talk to us, you cunts. Get the governor." So anyway, he's like, I've got no here, you got a message us. He's like, that definitely used boys are fucking writing as us. Anything happens, you got a message for the governor. Anything happens to Jim. And my brother should be found fucking hanging from a cell bar, fall down a fucking flight of stairs and die. Or otherwise, then we're just gonna come down and we're gonna fucking start doing his right. You used to do that? Ah, oh fuck. Did they hide? Murder is, people and kid on a suicide. This is a serious situation. We were talking fucking two of the top screws in Berlin getting done for taking a bribe. Mm -hmm. And other top officials getting fucking demoted and put out of jail. Like, fucking serious, but a serious, but I worked in Pala. A lot of people might know, might oh, not think that, that went on, you know what I mean? But, anyways, um, where, where, where was I sent you there? Yeah. With Jim, you phoned us. I phoned this up, I phoned up, phoned up Berlin on the, on the Saturday, Saturday evening. I know what's happened to my brother, I know he's caught. And if anything has should happen to Jim, he should be fucking found hanging from a set of bars, a rope in his neck, a suicide, or she's falling down a flight of stairs, fucking whack your families, don't get a fuck who he's up. Fucking get your wings going to school, your mom going to the fucking bingo, don't give a fuck. That's the message for that cunt. Fucking tell him for me. So my dad's out. My dad's out, he's alive this time, he's, he's fucking, he's at his peak in danger, you know what I mean? <laughs> Fuck's sake. So anyways, um, the next day, I'm done, me and Archie, we're done on the Sunday. <laughs> fucking hell, man. So anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm not only really going back to fucking face the music for the escape and, and, and the bribe, I'm going back to fucking threat to murder all our <laughs> I went, I'm Fuck fucking there, but the first country to get whacked here, man. I'm fucking. <laughs> you try to help oh, everybody else, you know what I think it's oh, well, I'm dead, my fucking. I'll well, take my own life for now. So, anyways, and the next morning, after the screws had left and shook their hands and congratulated us on the escape and whatever else, you know, fucking mind you, mind gives the statement, guys, once their trial's over, we'll not fit them up, you know, because we were desperate for it. For, for the screws, you know, one that took, one that took a bribe. So anyways, next morning, the cell door opens and of course the man Andy Gallagher, slash of Gallagher as they called him, but he comes walking into the, into my cell, right up to the, right up to where I was in the corner. And he took his hat off and he went, 
I thought you were been out of the fucking country. I thought your dad would go out of the country. Had you out of the country? I said, maybe the next time, Andy. So I hope, <laughs> I hope there will be a next time. I said, well, there fucking will be a next time. Make no, give him some grief for make, that make, thing, Andy. Make no mistake about it. And he was out there, he got away and he went, oh, by the way, he says, uh, you know you can go somewhere, didn't you? If, if you pick a jail and let me know where it is. He was ready to walk away and he went, oh, and by the way, I got your message, the phone call you left. Who are you this one? I said, all right, you know, no problem. He says, listen, Steel, you know it's no bone drab break. It's spirits. I said, I fucking try to tell that Bobby Brody get the fucking 30 stitches in his fucking face, you crack body. <laughs> <laughs> and then he says, well, another thing, he says, what the fuck is it with you, Steels? He said, I'm with you on the phone, threat to fucking murder my staff and their families. <laughs> he said, your dad's come in and held a letter in, in Technicolor, threatening to kill me, blow the, blow the, blow the, blow the something, blow it up. <laughs> <laughs> He's wonderful. Well, that's the way it had to be. You had, you, if you didn't have, if you never had each other, mm -hmm. then you'd be fucking trampled into oh. the ground like a fucking flea. You know what I mean? You so really that's when your life at uh, a very young age, just all that fucking madness. Because yeah. what you've mm -hmm. said is. Yeah. Is, uh, that's like a fairy tale as well people see you talk to that story people mm -hmm. they're like fucking hell it's unbelievable mm -hmm. prison breaks and mm -hmm. jail sentence wrongly convicted and oh, here's, a, here's a laugh for you Jim maybe four times up I've and Joseph I, I finally got out I went to the special unit for five five years I was in there five years I got my act together and um would have liked to have done a lot of good things with my life. I'd have liked to become a probation officer or a psychologist or some mm -hmm. fucking thing and along the way to help others. It was mm -hmm. much the Learned same. Learn mistakes. Yeah. But anyway, there was only one thing stopping me from doing that. I, mean, I knew when I got I had to go and help Joseph. So I thought, fuck it. So I planned everything for Joseph while I was in the jail along with Joseph so he knew where he stood when I got out. So anyway, when he gets out, I said, right, oh, here we go, Joe. First jailbreak, he gets a home leave and... Uh, I've got him in the, got him in my mum's house. So there's a wee screws brought him out, a wee, wee, a wee, a wee garden. And he was a nice wee fella, you know what I mean? He was sitting having a couple of halves, I think he maybe too many halves, huh? And um, <laughs> so I've got I've got the wee crew on standby down, down in the street. And when I gave him the, the thumbs up, if they start to shout on the roof, on you go, Joe, Joe's innocent. So anyway... Joe goes and he's doing the stairs and he's sitting in my pal with me NW and he's off to London because this is we're putting him on the palace gates eh? we're taking the case to London we're taking it to the palace so Joe's off so I've got the guys to sign up so I walked in I said to Joe write, write, write a letter for the screw Joe and just say say, say the nice things you know what I mean to say it's not your fucking fault uh, because it didn't matter if I was the second safe for Scotland was taking me to home leave I'm still going to get off you and every country else know I'm innocent so he done that so I, I gives a letter to my sister Brenda. I mean, here, go and get a wee guy, wee scoot sitting in there. So as he's reading the letter, I've been out in the van and I've given the boys the sign. So they're all chatting, Joe, Joe, on you go. So the screws came in the walking one day and I mean, he's on the roof. So he's like, oh, can I use the phone to contact the, the home office? So the next thing, fucking coppers are everywhere. You know what I mean? Everywhere. Yeah. And, um, to find that he's not on the roof. This time he's a hundred odd miles away. So if you take him down to London, it's all the papers, you know, fucking... So it's a decoy? Aye, it's all right. But I know he's fighting his case, but he's never put a fight up this time. So we get him down to London, there's a big massive search run for him. So we decided to invite to draw attention, bring attention to the case and the, the miscarriage of justice and the wrongdoings of the police was to... We, we, got, a, we, got, a, we got my nice T-shirt made with a, with a crucifixion on it. You know the crucifixion of mm -hmm. Jesus, and um, and we, we got Joseph into the palace gates at a nice moment in time, and he spread his arms out like the crucifixion. You know his arms spread out, so we we, we handcuffed his beef 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 his hands to the gates, and we also super glued his, he he palmed his hands to the to the actual railings. So we'd all chant and fucking all the usual. And the coppers were all came from everywhere. And somebody said the Queen was peeing out of one What the commotion was there. <laughs> so anyway, and I know it was a hard thing. I'm a hard thing to, hard thing to, for Joseph today. And I'm saying to Joe, Joe, you, you, you just can't go on the run, bro, and fucking go and live it up in Spain. You need to take it, go on the run and take the fight right fucking back to him. Hunt yourself in. And style. Make a stand. Make a fucking... David Nacon else he'd ever done before, Joe. We need to fight these kinds How long did the day? Joe ended up being 16. 16, 16 yeah. yeah. And it was proved I got a not guilty after yeah. it. Not but after that, I had to go back and break him out of Sockton. Because I did promise him, I said, I promise you, Joe, once you hunt yourself in, 
I guarantee you'll have you to fin a year. I promise you, bro. But you must hold yourself in, Joseph. You're defeating the person where you don't, bro. You need to take this fight to them. Did they struggle with that to hold yourself? They did, I. It was fucking, it was a shame, you know. Mm-hmm. But nevertheless, it had to be done. So anyways, I'm, a couple of months later, and I'm up visiting them, I said, right, I'm coming to get you. I'm going to, I'm going to come get you, so we, we know how we're going to do it. So anyways, I'm up. Me and my pals, we've cut the fucking fence and I'm lying back in the field and I'm watching through binoculars and I can see I can see them on I can see them on the football field there. Yeah. I can see the screws, I can see the screw walking by, you know, and so Joe knows exactly where the fence is cut in a big big L shape. So I'm lying there with the binoculars. So my pals like to me, listen, Johnny. And I went, what is it? And he went, fucking sighting he's we better get to fuck. I went, it's cool, man, you know, you don't think they know about this. If that was the case, the football field would be empty. The fucking whole year would be on lockdown. Nah, you're cool. But he was panicking. Come on, please, just in case they're on to us. So we left the scene just as all the prisoners were coming to the football field. And I've got a guy waiting on a cattle wagon out in the main street to pick your jaw up when he, when he gets through there. So we go back and we find out where the signs are. And he goes, away do And it turns out that the screws club where they drink had been broken into. Yeah, so the cockles went to investigate that. So anyway, we dashed back, and I'm fucking back in the position, I'm looking through the binoculars. And I went, there's still no movement, and he couldn't have made a move. And I went, oh, here, hold it, hold it, hold it, there we go. There he goes. Nice one, bro. And I went, you're not looking, that's no joke. And I went, the fuck is that? Oh, here he comes now. <laughs> I went, what the fuck, who's that, man? And I went, nice one, there he goes, that's definitely him now. And I was held on him, it's no him either. Now, where to hear you? It's going to be him this time. No, it's a step fuck. <laughs> End up six of them escaped. <laughs> when, when, we, when, we, when we went to investigate the break in for the Screws Club, we'd missed Joe. Could they, the guys gave Joe a 20 minute start mm-hmm. before they sort of when they fuck up and went wrong. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I said, let's get to fuck, man. The fucking, can you see that? So I don't know what's happened because I'm on communicado with Joe, mm-hmm. so the, the guy's got the phone. So we'd next back out and into your, into your in car. So we're driving down. I went, pull there, pull there. I seen this country soaking because you've got to run through a stream the, the, the bit they mm-hmm. were escaping from her. So I seen this country soaking. I said, pull over and I knew by the clays uh, he was a jailbird. Mm-hmm. I went, here, pal. I said, I'm Johnny Boy George, bro. I said, where the fuck is he? He said, we get him off an hour start, Johnny. Gonna use a lift. And we're driving along the road and I read back. And I went, pull in. There, there my pal, or his brother it was. The two boys from Edinburgh, men don't be fucking pick free and, <laughs> and dropped <laughs> and and and, and dropped him off in Edinburgh. Uh-huh. Right. So anyway, he's got a few weeks. And uh, we make we makes our way back to Glasgow and, and Jim's waiting there at the football park and uh, he's where is he? And I went, he's fucking out, Jim. And he went, I said, where is he? I don't fucking know where he is. Fucking six of them escape, man. I don't drop drop cunts off over Edinburgh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're fucking kidding me, aren't you? So I get a phone call for a pal of mine. He's like, Johnny boy, I've got Joe here, he's on the chair, I'm just about to chop his hair off. And he'd hear like you. Mm-hmm. And I went, don't fucking touch it. Because if he took his hair off, he'd look like a fucking serial killer. <laughs> One of his faces. <laughs> don't touch his fucking hair, man. Because we're going to use him for publicity stunts. Mm-hmm. And uh, so anyway, we've got the BBC crew. I've got a wee crew that I became pal of me and when I was done the Melanie special and I was done a documentary on me. And um, they, they just took a shine to me, this guy and his family. And they went, Johnny, you ever get out? He said, I've got 3,000 acres of land up in the guy. Uh-huh. I've got cottages. I'd like you to take a cottage and come down with your family and enjoy your life. I mean, so anyway, contact someone. I said, go to Huddy Joe here. He went, Johnny, we're interested in a documentary. Can, you, can we come on board? I went, yeah. So we end up on islands. Me and Joe end up in fucking islands over Scotland. Man, man particularly McCormick Islands, away by Jura. When we met the BBC, when we gave them the coordinates, we were already camped up there when they turned up. And uh, This is Wales on the run? This is Wales on the run. They're kicking all the doors in North Scotland, mm-hmm. didn't they? We were in an island. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So anyway, a funny part here, a funny bit for you. So Joe's sitting there and I'm hiding. Can I, I'm, a, I'm out in bail. I've been done. I've been done for fucking the breakouts. <laughs> so the coppers got me in the cop shop and right in the light to me, right, what the fuck? Can I have been mucking nothing to do with me? I don't fucking know where he was, mate. Okay, so we'll let you please bail. So I've got a big cagoule on like a fisherman and I'm sitting on the island with Joe when he, these guys are talking to him. But I can't you say fuck off? Because I'm fucking thinking, now he's coming and he's bailing and I'm going to come back and pounce from yeah. But anyway, they're talking about the escape and Joseph giving them the story of just why he was doing what he was doing, you know. Why he was bringing it to the attention. I get fitted up for the murder of the six fucking people. 
He said, I've also wrote to Mrs Doyle before I escaped and told her I was going to escape and that if anything, uh, she's got nothing to worry about and if the police try and fucking put any shit in her head, I have nothing to do with the death of your family. I'm now fighting for my own fucking life mm -hmm. and I'm fucking sorry whatever happened. You know, that kind of way, you know. So anyway, we had that wee crew ways for, for six weeks. Eh, for about for six. We're on this island. Funny part. While on the run still? Aye, we're on the island, eh? <laughs> So the guys like to Joe, and I'm hiding behind me, I'm fucking hiding my big cagoule like a fisherman. The guys like to hear Joe, must be awful wrong right here, Joe, on your own, eh? And he went, aye, no, you heard it. <laughs> I thought, fucking never, the sheep on the island. <laughs> he's like, cut, cut. He's fucking making a hunt on the sheep. <laughs> ah, you do, man. Oh, yeah. Sick, man. Anyway, what we were going to do was, when we get back to the mainland, um, I was like, right, Joe, what are we going to do here? Why don't we just fucking go back to Sockton? When everybody's out in the football field, just walk right up there, Joe, with a chain still saw and fucking blast the fence and walk right back in again. I said, no, I'll fucking give them something to think about. Oh, but I know how all the reporters are waiting there. I'll give these cunts something to think about. Hey, fucking what to play fucking tig with us. So anyway, it's like, right, great idea. So I phoned the, the necessary people. Like, John, that'd be fucking class. You see, Paul has one have Johnny, fucking class. Never known anything like that. <laughs> so I was in touch with another guy, and the guy's like to me, he said, I've got a phone call for... Uh, Andrew Coyle, who's now the head part, he, now, he was the governor, Dr. Andrew Coyle, he's now in the de prison department. So him and Jimmy Boyle always kept in touch, and I kept in touch with Jimmy. So Jimmy's like, Johnny Boy, he says, now I'm going to believe it. It's a phone call for Andrew Coyle, and he goes like, Jimmy, I've had a fucking, I've had a bad dream. He said, the Queen's Company unveil a statue in Edinburgh in the morrow. And I fucking hope if she didn't pull that fucking veil off and Joe Steele sign on <laughs> So they had all the security in and that's how bad mm. it was. They had all the security and they turned out we'd never done that. But anyway, it turns out we done a documentary and we finished that. We done it in your house with the family get together and Joe and my mum are all greeting, usually not. So Joe's in agony by this time. Joe, I don't know what's wrong with him. I don't know if he's kidneys or whatever, but he's in mortal agony. So he feels as if he's wanting to go to the hospital. And I said, well, you can't, we can't protest in the hospital, Joseph. That's a fucking no-no. So why don't we go to Berlini, which is only up the road, only half a mile away from Berlini, right? Why don't you fucking go to Berlini, Joe? Climb up that big fucking tower right outside the front gate with a camera on it. He went, right, OK, I'll, I'll go for that one. And, that, and that's what we've done. So we could do it in the street. That's what this one's doing. Fuck's sake. We could do it in the street. And I held a black hack. <laughs> And uh, I go like the guy, me and Joe jumped in. And they're all heading up, they're all heading on up in the motors of the convoy and all the protesters, hundreds of them all, and they're all heading up in vans and fuck knows what. So I held this black hack and uh, this fella's in it. And he's like, where you going, boy? He said, take it up to the bar, pal. And he went, aye, anybody. He said, where you going, the special you're at? And I went, no, just up to the bar. And I'm looking at him, I can see in the mirror. And I'm saying, I know that cunt's face was somewhere. <laughs> so anyway, I didn't say nothing. He went, and this is the truth. And he went, like, he says, uh, uh, I'm just back for holiday. He says, uh, before I left, he said, that, that wee Joe Steele and that done the escape. He says, you know, do you know if they've caught him yet? <laughs> so I've done his door. He says, fuck off. I mean, I don't know, pal. But anyway, we're halfway up the fucking aisle to Berlini where the, where the big gates are. Mm -hmm. So I've like to the guy because Joe's getting took right up to the front gate. So I'm halfway up, to, you know, the aisle taking up to Berlini oh, gates. Okay. I'm maybe about 200 yards, 300 yards for I said, just pull there and let me out, pal. So I've threw Joe the score. And I went, give him, give fucking for that guy. And Joe just said, uh, Joe said, take me up to that pile and up there, mate. Yeah, and the next fucking thing, Joe's up the pile and all the protests are walking out the car park. We're already waiting there, fucking big banner. And <laughs> so the next thing, the taxi drivers come back down. Do, 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 do. But it turns out the guy says to me, uh, before I go to the taxi, I've got a cousin that was in Berlin, and I'm looking at him, and I'm like, he's going to say Jimmy Boyle, because he looked like Jimmy. Mm -hmm. And I went, have you said, you know, Jimmy Boyle was in there. And I went, all right. But never, never took him on it now. But anyway, Joe's up there and the fucking all the jail shut down, all the screws out, the fucking, the, oh, and the TV crew and every cunt's all there. A spectacular fucking break in. We broke him out of stock and broke him into Berlin. <laughs> and uh, so next thing was, uh, the taxi driver came back down and he's like, doo, 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 and fucking waving up there. <laughs> I got a phone call for Jimmy Boyle the next day and he went, here Johnny Boy, he said, do you know who that was? was I fucking loved you, my fucking cousin. <laughs> For fuck's sake. Well, mate, your stories are, they're yeah. unbelievable. Has anybody ever contacted you today? I film or a proper documentary 
I put them. Yeah, yeah, we've done we've done a couple of documentaries, a couple of people talking about film, but I think we're just fucking far. Uh, far know, in, you know? The stories are fucking unbelievable, yeah. and obviously for what you've been through, and all we can laugh, kind of laugh because yeah. obviously laughter's the best yeah. medicine. But for what you've been through, for a young boy, man, how was you, how was your mindset? No, still fucked up, James. Did you yeah. ever get help? Yeah, no. And there's, there's, there's nobody can really do it to help you. It's too far gone now, man. It's like fucking, you know. Uh, but you're never too far. And what you've, what you, what, even though it's prison breaks and all that, I'm, but what I'm, you. I'm good at helping other people with uh, problems. I'm seeing it comes to any problem. You're, you're, people don't expect you to need I know, any but you tend help, you know? to the ones who do help. Everybody else is the ones yeah. who always need the most yeah. help. But for even the prison, you sound like a fucking genius. Yeah. You sound, yeah. don't you? Sound, seen it's a, unbelievable I'm, what you. I'm, create. See, I'm seeing a counselor right now, actually, for uh -huh. the. I could have lawyers put me onto a counsellor, they, they organised for a counsellor to have, so I think I'm having 20 sessions uh -huh. um, for counselling for what happened in the first school, uh -huh. you know, like, you know what I mean? But Aye, never, never then, I, I, I was my own counsel, you know. Aye, because um, we, we were talking about it earlier, we had um, a guy, Tom Urey, and an actor on before you, this is the second podcast we've done today, so mm. he, we were talking about 75% um, of suicides are now are, are male, and in the UK, as we don't talk about our feelings, we don't talk about our emotions, you know what I mean? So that's where yeah. all the aggression and all the anger, because we, we're too manly to say yeah. we've got yeah. problems or feelings. Do you regret anything that you've done? Would you change it? But you, you know that's never ever going to happen. You're, oh. never gonna, you're never going to get in that position to say, mm -hmm. I would change it, because it's never, it's just a, it's a fantasy, a, yeah. a, a fantasy answer, you know what I mean? It's a fantasy question. But everything you know you've achieved, mate, you, I wouldn't surprise me, mate, if you could go back and change it, no, no, the no. stuff that you've done. Yeah. I think I've, it's, I've, I've still kind of messed up. I've still uh -huh. got a lot of bitter fucking anger in me, you know that? Have you? A lot of bitter anger, aye, of course, aye. Frustration, hatred? Yeah, just anger, sheer anger. You know, when you lie in the cell blocks for all eight years and you've got fucking much hatred in you and you've... And all you can think about is murder and screws and our mm -hmm. families and our wives and then we get out there and, then you, and, and things seem to be nice one day and then the next fucking day I'm like, fuck my day and sitting here in a fucking beach mash about killing these fucking and it's right. it's no it's no you can, no, you've be. not got anybody to talk to it's no it's no good mate it's but no it's good that you're getting help for it and it can help you but then yeah. everything you've been through man there's a thing where you can go maybe go into jails and start talking to maybe young yeah. offenders well, I've already done that I've, I've done a I've done a I've done a debate in Millennia there not so long ago I've eh? done there talking to all the cons about you know fucking uh -huh. how, how to survive you know uh -huh. um, I'm also on my second book eh? it's called Scots on the Rocks Scots on the Rocks it's all about jailbreaks eh? mm -hmm. people love that yeah. where can people buy your first book for people listening uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm quite sure it's on Amazon now right. Amazon um a bird that never flew. So the title was actually off for coat of arms. The bird that never flew. The bird that never flew. So yeah. I was reading bits of it obviously the last few days. I know you're coming on, man. It's powerful stuff. And when's the next book out? When are you releasing I'm, that? I'm still I'm still working on that. Uh, I'm quite fortunate that I've I've got uh, that some of the some of the stories I'm writing about that the guys are still alive and uh -huh. and I'm working on their stuff and uh, my main stuff, main jailbreak for me and my brother Jim and of course Joseph's jailbreaks. Uh, another big guy. I might be introducing him one day. Sonny Leach called the Sockton Harrier. Mm -hmm. Big Sonny actually escaped out of the prison wall. He put a number five or something on the back of his vest with boot polish, a pair of shorts on, a pair of jail boots. Dripped off the, dripped off a 20 feet wall, down, and they uh, ran into a, ran in a corner for a couple of miles and ran into, a, ran into a police roadblock. They stopped him and they said, have you seen these guys? And the guys that was in the photograph mm -hmm. Was safe blowers for, for, for Black Hill, yeah, Black Hill family, well known family in Black Hill. So he said, No, I've not seen them. Ten minutes later, the police come up to the roadblock and said, Have you seen this cunt? He just ran by, he just ran by his ten minutes to go. <laughs> yeah, so he's got quite a, he's got a few uh -huh. stories to tell you about. Oh, he's a character, he's and, a real uh, character, you know. We've thoroughly enjoyed your story, no doubt we could talk. We've been speaking on the phone yeah. the last couple of weeks, man, and your stories yeah. are unbelievable. And yeah. obviously, for what you've done, came through, but now that you're getting help and speaking to other people, man, it takes massive balls. And what you've done, mate, it takes massive courage, man. And for to try to get change and try to get help and yeah. fair play to you, man. I really appreciate you coming, yeah. coming on today, hey, Johnny boy. Man, it's been brilliant having hey, you on. Really appreciate it, man. So I'm free to go now. I'm free to go. <laughs> you can't ask. Not if you'd have escaped, no way. Anyway.